Okay, then we are ready to start. And the first speaker of the morning is George Gottwald from the University of Sydney. And he will talk about levy flights. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much to the organizers for giving me a chance to speak to you and uh, happy birthday to the. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to present some strong evidence that um, we have now found a spatially extended system, so an SPDE that although it's not driven by alpha stable noise uh, directly and no sort of none of these known mechanisms are explicitly built in, um, exhibits alpha stable diffusive behavior and anom 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 anomalous diffusion. And this is um, joint work together with Shung Shi Zhao. And I first, whoops, what's this? Uh, pre, uh, um, tell you about this equation. So it's a stochastic Landau-Lifschitz-Gilbert equation. Looks horrible. It is horrible. It's very, very complicated. Um, it models physics. It models uh, the magnetization along a, a, a nanowire, but that's completely irrelevant. This is just an example of an SPDE uh, and has certain uh, qu uh, qualities that I'd like to discuss briefly. So the actual nature of this equation is not so, not so important. So it's three components, M1, M2, M3. Um, we have Gaussian driving here, so it's not explicitly driven by Libby noise. Um, it's non-preserving, so you notice there's an M cross in, uh, in front of every term. So if you start with norm one, you, uh, you stay, uh, the dynamics remains on the sphere. Um, it's dissipative, lambda is a positive non-zero uh, constant, so that causes dissipation. Um, there's a translational invariance, and in the deterministic case, so when this noise term is equal to zero, the, uh, it has front solution. So one front solution I've um, plotted here. So this um, is, there's a tench solution for the M1 component. M2 component is like a Sedge solution and it's zero in M3. This is a stable solution. Um, and the question is now what happens to the solution when we switch on the noise? And here I show a waterfall plot of the M1 component. So it's a tench, it goes from minus one to, to one. So this is a plus one, this is a minus one solution. And you see the frontal interface undergoes some stochastic process here. And I want to present some strong evidence um, that the process that this frontal, the domain wall, uh, or this front interface performs is actually a Levy flight. Um, so I'm going to start first with what one could expect. And so let's go to PDEs again. Um, so if we have an equivariant um, um, PDE, then under certain um, you know, conditions, we can transform this you know, infinite dimensional system into the skew product ODE where X um, is the base dynamics and then orthogonal to it is the dynamics along the group um, denoted by this gamma dot here. So um, if you, if, I mean, lots of people here are specialists in this, but if you're not familiar with it, you have done this. Uh, for example, if you had a PDE that has front solutions and translational uh, invariants, you go into a moving frame of reference, then you solve an ODE, that's this one here. And then the group dynamics is just the constant translation uh, of, of the um, front in front interface with a constant speed. So, um, if we now switch on the noise, um, then intuitively, I don't think there's rigorous theory, or at least I don't, I don't have it, um, but then the, the spatial dynamics, because it's contracting, um, is controlled, so the noise is controlled, so the, the front solution will sort of keep its shape, more or less, but along the group orbit, um, that's neutral, so along this direction, the noise uh, can, can you know, diffuse and you have some kind of non-trivial, um, <coughs> can have a non-trivial pro uh, stochastic process along the group orbit there. Um, so we expect, since we have a, uh, for this SLLG equation, this translational uh, invariance, we expect that the, the, the frontal interface undergoes some stochastic process, but the question is what type of noise? And I've shown you here this uh, thing that sort of um, shows an uh, uh, Levy, Levy noise, I'll kind of get back to how we got there. But before that, I just want to briefly say what is what are alpha stable processes and then discuss some of the sort of known mechanisms on how you generate alpha stable processes. So how you generate something like this without explicitly driving it with Levy noise. 
So a uh, tricky uh, definition here. If so, we say a random variable X is strictly a stable law. If we can sum them up, scale appropriately, and then that random variable is distributed according to the same law as the variables that are put in. So Gaussian variables are clearly, you know, as an example where BN is the uh, square root of N, uh, but there are more. There's a three parameter family. And um, so this is stability parameters, skewness parameter and the shape parameter. And they're called the alpha stable noises, uh, alpha stable uh, processes, or uh, laws, sorry. And um, alpha equal to two is the Gaussian case. So the smaller alpha is, the fatter are the tails. Um, the normalization constant here goes with n one on uh, uh, alpha. So if alpha is equal to two, it's our standard um, central limit theorem uh, scaling. Uh, but these, if alpha is strictly less than two, then the moments of order uh, less than p, they are uh, uh, larger than, uh, than alpha, they, uh, they are unbounded. Um, and uh, we don't have for these PDFs, we don't have an explicit uh, um, expression, but we can give it through the characteristic function here. Um, so that you can, you can also extend to as, uh, alpha stable processes. So that's a cat like process that has independent stationary increments such that um, the, the, uh, the prosy at T uh, is in distribution uh, um, according to this. And this is just an example here. So beta is the skewness parameter, beta equal to zero means positive jumps are equally likely to negative jumps. So now um, I want to tell you some dynamic, uh, um, present some dynamic uh, mechanisms, how you generate this process and um, entirely deterministic. So the central limit theorem breaks down for these, um, for, for these uh, um, um, random variables. And how can sort of in the deterministic setting, how can the central limit theorem break down? So the, the variance, when you do the central limit theorem, this is you know, what Alexei uh, uh, yesterday nicely, nicely um, mentioned in his talk, is given by the green Kuber formula. So you have the variance plus the sum over the, or the integral over the autocorrelation function. So there's two ways that can break down. First of all, your, uh, your observable um, is not L2. So then, you know, your integral V squared is, is not defined or you're non-summable. So I want to give you two examples here. So one, we have an unbounded observable. So it's, um, uh, uh, we're not in L2. Uh, and I have a driver here, which is, you know, a logistic map. And then my V has this, um, the driver here, which is one on X to the gamma. Okay, so if X goes to zero, this thing here uh, can explode. And so this is one case. And the other case I'm gonna show you is when the uh, autocorrelation function is not summable anymore. That's when we're looking at intermittent maps. So this is just an example here. So this is a logistic map running, but I'm plotting one on X to the gamma. So if ever X goes to zero I, or close to zero, I get these peaks and these peaks cause these jumps in the V, okay? And you can show, so this is, uh, I think Sebastian Grisel was the first who kind of realized this uh, when he had, um, he had used the doubling map, um, not the logistic map. <coughs> and so you can show that um, this uh, variable V, so that I can make a, a process out of this V and T, and I scale appropriately with one on alpha, where alpha is a function of gamma, um, that weakly converges to um, this uh, uh, alpha stable process. Um, you can, this is important um, for us later, you can um, extend this to the stochastic setting. So there's a process called the cum noise, correlated additive and multiplicative noise. And there's a lovely paper by Rachel Kuski and Joe Keller from the 2000s who show that that lies in the domain of the alpha stable uh, process. Uh, and again, it's these peaks there of the cum process that gives rise to those jumps. Um, so the next example here are intermittent maps. So we have a neutral fixed point here. And um, depending on this parameter gamma here, uh, we, can make the, uh, we can make that the autocorrelation function here is not summable uh, of this map. And we get this. So this is the intermittent map here. And we have this laminar periods where we are near zero 
and they correspond to this ballistic almost linear well, almost linear flights and that you can see up here so x star is the mean of the of the uh, uh, puma mandel map so whenever you're near zero you basically add up to vn a constant which is the mean so that gives rise to this um to this um um to this ballistic behavior here so it's the laminar periods that give rise and they can be arbitrary long if we have non-summable um, decay of correlations and they give rise here to this so um you can show uh, that this is um if you again you know look at a process uh, a, a constructed process here that you appropriately scale um that this converges to an alpha stable uh, uh, process in the um, m1 score hot uh, topology but you can even do kind of can kind of make it look sort of nicer by sort of squinting your eyes and going far away or do inducing and then you so you stop your clock whenever you enter this laminar period and then um, you can even get you know convergence of uh, neutral j1 uh, score out match topology okay so um these are now so this is just to show you how you can generate alpha stable uh, processes so these are two mechanisms um, but none of these mechanisms are built into this SLLG SPDE. Um, just a little remark or a side tangent. So Ian and I um, use those ideas, uh, mainly actually this one here, to construct a numerical integrator for an SDE that's driven by multiplicative uh, alpha stable noise. Um, so it's a completely different idea to do numerics rather than kind of doing Taylor expansions and so forth we see the SDE as a limit system, a slow fast limit system. This would be the uh, slow, uh, fast dynamics and you know, up there, whatever the V is that we can construct is the slow dynamics. Uh, and then this map serves as an integrator for this uh, SDE that naturally deals well uh, with this Markov, Markov noise for those of you who are interested in it. I'm happy to talk or, um, offline about this. So we're quite excited about it. Okay. So now um, let's add some symmetry. So we looked in this example, there was just an I extension. We just added up, you know, the, the, um, the X. So these are anisotropic systems with translational symmetry. Um, but <coughs> with Ian, we sort of proposed in 2013, um, we proposed sort of a universal view on diffusive behavior. So the question is, depending on the dynamics, you put in in your in your shape dynamics, space dynamics. What diffusive behavior can you expect, depending on the symmetry you put in? Um, and in particular, here we are interested in. So this was uh, uh, done for intermittent maps and this sort of weakly chaotic. So weakly chaotic means uh, you know we have non-summable um, decay of correlations of the um, um, of the uh, of the Yankov the Poincaré map, um, and this is anisotropic media, so um, translational invariance. There we have super diffusion plus a linear drift. Um, so that is some theory here that um, Ian started and, and with uh, Roland Zweimüller, and then uh, recently with uh, Ian Sheriev, Peter Fritz, um, and Alek uh, Alexei Korpanov and, and Zhang. And I've done some very minor thing uh, a while ago with Ian as well on this. Um, and if we have this is a dichotomy, if you have now um, an isotropic medium, so if you have some rotation there as well, so it depends on if the dimension, the ambient dimension is odd or even. So if it's even, then this alpha stable process, you know, these ballistic flights, they are suppressed by some averaging around the, um, uh, uh, um, through the rotation. So there we just get standard diffusion. Brownian motion. So there's no alpha stable uh, process can be generated in this case. And there we have a theorem there um, that in the odd case, so when we have, you know, think of, think of uh, R3, so you, you have like a fixed point, uh, uh, a, a fixed direction there along which you can um, diffuse. So there you can have these uh, um, uh, ballistic flights, but in the other directions, you will get um, uh, um, you average out so you always have this one direction where you don't average out and that should give super diffusion that's not a theorem that's um, something that we, we believe to be true um, okay so back 
to our PD, uh, PDE. So the way I want to approach now seeing um, what is the diffusive behavior of this SLAG equation um, is I can't do that in the SPD. That's too complicated. So we're going to do some reduction. We're going to reduce this infinite dimensional SPDE to a finite dimensional SDE. And the way we do that is um, using this uh, method of collective coordinates um, that we developed together with Madeleine Cartwright um, in her thesis. <coughs> um, so that says the following. That says kind of what you know what we said in the uh, at the beginning that the noise is sort of controlled for in, in the shape um, direction, but then is allowed to diffuse along the um, uh, along uh, along the uh, neutral group orbit. So we take a base solution, which is a solution when sigma is equal to zero. And now we sort of allow the shape to wobble a bit and we allow the translational variable here, the location uh, um, to move in time. So we allow the, the width of the, uh, of, the, of the front solution, the domain width to be a dynamic parameter. And these are the rotations in R3. Okay, so we allow the a process on the uh, stochastic process on the uh, on the sphere, and the aim is now to find a set of ODEs for these collective coordinates that are here in red. So for the shape ones, which is the theta, the eta, the psi, and the w, and the group one, which is the phi. Um, this is not a rigorous method, um, but it seems to work. So that's here we've given some example as well, but um, disclaimer: this is not. Um, this is not a rigorous method yet. I'm, I'm working with Bob Brink on trying to make it rigorous in, in a finite dimensional setting, but um, for this setting, I, I, I don't know. So how do you um, get these, um, these collective coordinate um, uh, evolution equations? Well, think of this as a Galerkin approximation. So now you just project onto, you, you project onto the tangent space that's um, parameterized by the, by the collective coordinates. So you take the partial derivatives with respect to all the coordinates and just project the error you're making onto that. <coughs> and that gives you a set of, um, of um, SDEs. Um, so if you do that, you get the shape dynamics here. You know, it's just application of Eto formula and um, the group dynamics. So I said it's not rigorous. So can we trust it? Let's do some test cases. So the G is sort of like the direction of the noise in this SLG equation. And if this small G is one zero zero, then we have an additional rotational uh, uh, symmetry around the M1 direction. And that has that you can solve analytically and that solution we can recover in this. So that's exactly recovered by doing that. So that's, that's one tick. Um, but if it's one, 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 then there's no analytic solution for it. Um, but we can try to reproduce the empirical histogram at a fixed time t. And these are the shape variables here for the, for the angles and the histogram matches nicely. So we have some hope, trust that the method actually there's something to it yeah, for this. Okay. The W is, the W is, so there would be a, a here. Uh, um, so X on W, so that's the, interface width, yeah? Uh, and the psi, the eta, and the theta are the rotation angles around the three respective axes, okay? And the phi is a translational variable. Yeah, I know what you want to say. You, you, you say that there's noise here as well, is that what? No, these are, these are they, there's only translational invariants. Yeah, only translational symmetry. So that's just one group variable. Okay. So the the these the the the, the angles only one of the angles is a translation uh, a uh, is another a group variable. If we end this one zero zero situation. Um, okay. So to see now we have you now know, systems it's much easier to analyze. Okay. So we can. Uh, look at what is the mechanism that gives rise to these jumps. And a nicer way to look at it, rather than at looking at these three angles, is to look at the amplitude in front of the tange and a sedge. Okay, so I call them A and B, 
and they've got three components that I can express in terms of my angles. So that's uh, given up here. And this is just an example of how the, you know, the A and the B perform this stochastic process on the, on the sphere. So now the chain of events that gives rise to this, um, um, to this alpha stable behavior is this. So this is, um, this is A, so the tange, the front, right, uh, amplitude. So from plus one, tange looks like this, minus one looks like this. And here's a near flip. So the tange goes like this, and then it kind of goes up again. And when you have this near flip, what it causes is a jump or a spike in the interface width. So when you do this, you also broaden. And then associated with that, um, uh, 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 with that spike in the in the interface width, you get this jump in the um, uh, in, in the location of the interface. So and this is the equation here for the for the phi. So d phi is dt is w times something that's bounded, and the w has this spike. So it's it's, it's this unbounded observable. Um, um, example that I presented in this, uh, um, you know, at the beginning, that seems to be the underlying mechanism producing alpha stable noise in this um, SPDE here. Um, so <coughs> this is the full um, SLLG equation. So this is phi, this is W here. So here you just see like this little peak, but then you see sort of this kind of, that's not very convincing, I would say, right? So when we just look at the SLL, like simulations of the SLLG equation, we never thought that there's any, any kind of uh, um, anomalous diffusion in there, right? We kind of expected some, you know, some diffusive process, but we never thought, okay, there is any kind of, you know, um, anything anomalous here, right? The, the phi just, that's just kind of, okay. I mean, two, two unit, spatial units here, but it's not much. Um, and I, I'll tell you why, but I mean, if you sort of look at the time series that we observe in the SPDE of the interface, sort of on short time scales, and um, of you know our collective coordinates, it sort of has the same or re similar qualitative behavior. So this SLLG equation has been studied widely from a physical point of view, from a mathematical point of view. Um, people have looked at it for for a long, long time. So why have they never seen these jumps? Well, it's this mechanism here. So if W goes to, to infinity, that means the front interface becomes larger and larger and larger. So if you have a finite box in your numerical integrator, you're gonna violate your Neumann boundary conditions. So um, you never see, you will, ne my claim is you won't see this or, you know, sort of significant jumps which are significant spikes in the double caused by the significant spikes in the, in the front interface, you won't see that in uh, uh, numerical uh, simulations. But nevertheless, it seems to be there, and we can study this in, the, um, uh, in, 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 in this SDE, because it doesn't care about the boundary conditions, right? We, we integrate it over all the spatial variations here. So that's an important point to make, and uh, that has never been seen in simulation that we claim you can't see it because of this underlying mechanism uh, in the SPDE. Um, so it shows a bit about the power of uh, reduction that you can you know, see things in the reduced systems that you wouldn't be able to see um, by just simply studying you know, solutions of the full SPDE. Um, so that brings me to the end here, so a quick summary. Um, so we showed strong evidence that this is uh, that the SLLG equation is SPD exhibits emergent superdiffusion. So again, emergent means that it's not explicitly driven by alpha stable noise, and none of those mechanisms that we discussed are explicitly built into this into this SPDE. Um, we identified the underlying dynamical mechanism, which is this widening of the of the front, and. Um, we also discussed briefly this universal view on diffusive behaviors um, for deterministic spatially extended systems uh, with symmetry. And again, here, this is a long time simulation of this SDE where we see this, um, this jumps. So we've actually used standard um, 
algorithms, you know, standard uh, uh, time series analysis methods to um, get the alpha here, right? Uh, of the, um, the the corresponding alpha of this um, Levy stable process. So it's around 1.3. So we use p variation, uh, quantile regression, some maximum likelihood methods, and, and looking at the tail behavior, it looked like at four or five different methods. They all gave values around from 1.3 to 1.6. So for finite data, they give different, it's known that these methods give you know slightly different answers. So um, this time series analyzed with standard time series analysis methods shows that we actually have an alpha stable process. Um, an outlook, <coughs> can we prove this convergence to Levy noise? Right? So can we use some of the symmetry perspective uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning, not collective coordinates, but this uh, symmetry method um, to, sh you know, to see what's, what will uh, um, make this rigorous, may make, uh, show this convergence to, um, to alpha stable process rigorously, because one possibility, even if this method is not, you know, or it's not rigorous. So what could be, this could be even transit, uh, transitory behavior. Okay. So in the long-term behavior, we wouldn't have any alpha stable noise. So I can't exclude that. Um, at the beginning, I said I don't care at all about the physics here and, and, and what it models. Um, but there's two sort of issues that may, may be worthwhile uh, uh, mentioning. So the microscopic model for this SLG equation is, is a spin chain, so Heisenberg spin chains. And there it's known that you can have this sort of flips and you can have anomalous diffusion in there. And then people, um, so this is relatively recent work in the last four years or three, four years shown that um, that is in the universality class of the KPZ equation. So, but the KPZ equation is, you know, that's, it doesn't describe the, it describes the correlation function of the, um, uh, of the spin system. It doesn't describe, uh, you know, a frontal solution. So that's kind of different to what we observe here. And then there's some kind of cool effect called the Barkhausen effect that has been known since the beginning of the, the 20th century. So it's when you have a, a wire and you change some genetic field Sometimes you have this crackling noise, it kind of you have sort of this noise that you can hear, and it's sort of this. Um, th these are these domain fronts that you know uh, quickly uh, move there, and that was always explained. Or I'm not a specialist at all here, but I've read somewhere that you know one one mechanism is that there are kind of impurities in your in, in your wire, and then you know your front stays there, and then suddenly you know moves very fast, um, and you get these jumps. Uh, and that uh, uh, gives it has an acoustic effect. But what this suggests is that um, you can get these behaviors even without any kind of topological constraints that are sort of built into the nanowire, but just entirely deterministically. Coffee time. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's okay. Okay, so then we are ready to resume from the coffee break. And now we have Peter Balin from Budapest, and he will talk about some polygonal tessellations. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be here. And uh, let me thank also Ian. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying happy birthday. I, I'm saying instead, uh, thanks for being around and for all that you contributed to this community, which is quite a lot. And personally to me, you gave a lot and go on like this for another three, four decades. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, your impact uh, is evident from, uh, from the depths and the variety of topics that we see at this conference. It's clear. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, on the one hand might not seem that, uh, close to what I'm doing in general, because I'm, I'm working mostly on chaotic billiards and related stuff. So it's sort of a side project, um, which I've been involved in, which I like. Uh, uh, but it's also uh, uh, certainly connected uh, uh, to what I learned from Ian, um, because it's related to averaging, and although it's in a very simple context. So uh, for this talk, probably the abstraction of the methods will not be that deep uh, and not that difficult as we saw in many other talks. Uh, what uh, makes this talk yet 
interesting for me is uh, building up the model uh, for this uh, problem. Uh, so let me uh, uh, tell now that uh, my co-authors on this work are Gabor Domokos and Kristina Reger. Uh, they are also from the Technical University of Budapest. Um, and you may have heard of Gabor Domokos. He, he's at the Faculty of Architecture, actually, but he's at the interface of geology, ar architecture, mathematics. Um, and uh, the way you may have heard his name is related to this thing called Gömbertz. So this is like creating a body, a three-dimensional body, which is a single stable fixed point, a single unstable fixed point. This is a question of Arnold, whether you can create something like that. And he solved this problem. And it's interesting the way he solved this problem was that he just lying on the seashore and observing pebbles and uh, examining them. And that's how he got uh, to this idea of creating the Gumbertz. And uh, so this is now something that's uh, uh, quite known. And he continued working in these type of questions. So the type of questions that arise here have the motivation coming from geological pattern formation. Uh, and uh, to create some sort of theory for that. And Christina, uh, she's Gabor's student, uh, graduate student, and uh, she's really talented. She's been involved in several projects and has some nice results. So uh, what are polygonal tessellations for us? Uh, these are simply just mosaics, which is just the tiling of the plane of the Euclidean playback convex polygons. So that's it. You tie the pink convex polygons. So these uh, pictures are taken from their other projects. Uh, the left two are mud crack patterns. So these are taken from some surface on the earth where you see some mud which has been cracked in course of a cracking process. And this uh, right panel is a photo of the planet Mars. Okay, so uh, now these formations you can think of being modeled as convex polygonal tilings. Uh, so this is sort of the motivation. Now to describe uh, such things, let me introduce MD will denote these just some positive number. Uh, the intersection of the tiling uh, with a disk of radius d, okay? Uh, and to be more precise, about a point p. And the averaging that we will do will correspond to increasing d, right? Because for a fixed d, we can certainly introduce some macroscopic quantities, uh, which are essentially combinatorial nature, but not just reflect the structure of the graph, a little... Uh, more metric. So two obvious quantities that you can describe, uh, introduce, uh, we will denote the total number of vertices and uh, such a polygonal tiling. So uh, this is just how many vertices you see in the graph. And F will denote the total number of faces or cells, vertex or node or face and cell are just the same thing for me, right? And there's one more quantity uh, which I introduce as follows. So J will run on the faces or the cells of my tiling. And to each face, I just count the corners of the J's face, the corner as a polygon. So it's not the same as the number of edges on the bound, a number of vertices along the boundary of the face, because I only take into account uh, uh, the uh, vertices uh, that make a corner of the polygon. I will be, uh, uh, it will be more clear in a moment. So, and then I just add this up, right? For all the faces. So these are uh, corners counted multiplicity. Okay, so here are two baby examples to demonstrate this. Uh, this left panel has four faces apparently, right? It has nine vertices. And this N star is 16 because I have four uh, squares. So I just, it just have four times four. Now uh, in this panel, I have five faces, uh, 12 vertices. 
and n star is 20 because each of them contribute by four. So this one is not a corner of that uh, face, right? Uh, although it's a vertex at the boundary of the face. Uh, so I've circled this one and uh, I introduce for a specific node or vertex two different type of degrees. One is the combinatorial degree, the number of edges uh, that meet in that vertex in my graph. And and I star two, which is two, how many cells are there of which this vertex arises as a corner? Okay, so this corner degree and combinatorial degree are distinguished at this uh, um, level. Okay, uh, so this way, uh, it's not just an entirely graph uh, description uh, that this quantity n star involves. Okay, and I will say that the node is regular if these two are equal, so such, uh, uh, this is a regular node, right? But this is ir ir irregular uh, because uh, there an i star is less than an i, right? And this n star up to some boundary effects can be computed uh, by adding up the n i star of all the vertices instead of adding up the f i star of all the faces, right? So I just count the corners by, by or uh, vertices by multiplicity, right? Okay. So given all this, uh, let's introduce this average quantity. So these are sort of density type quantities that I divide n star by V. This will be the average nodal corner degree so that a typical edge, what sort of nodal corner degree, typical vertex, what sort of nodal corner degree has. And uh, this V bar star is an average cell corner. Maybe as typical cell, how many corners does it have, right? So these are the quantities that we can introduce. And these are the quantities that people uh, studied. And for this particular project, it turns out to be a little more convenient to introduce just X and Y, which are just the reciprocals of these quantities. Okay, so these will be numbers between one and zero, right? So X, which is V over N star and uh, Y, which is F over N star. Okay, it's just a little more convenient. Okay, and I introduced the notion of a balanced tiling or a balanced mosaic, uh, which says that uh, you compute these things for a fixed region, right? And then uh, as you let uh, the disk radius grow, uh, these density type quantities have a fixed uh, limit, right? Moreover, uh, I would say that uh, this limit has to be independent of P, where you started from. So this is saying that your tiling doesn't have a sort of strange oscillations in its geometric uh, description and quantity. Let me also add that I will also assume, although it's not written on the slide, but implicitly I will also assume that uh, the sizes of the polygons are controlled in my tiling. So that uh, the diameter of a polygon uh, is between two uh, bounds and uh, there's a circle uh, which I can prescribe in every polygon and this circle also has a, a, a lower uh, uh, bound. Okay, uh, so throughout we consider such balanced mosaics, so no strange geometries. Okay, okay. So uh, still about the description of these balanced mosaics, there are some a priori bounds on these quantities X and Y. So one of them is that Y cannot exceed one third. Uh, I'm below that red line. And that's because any cell has to have at least three corners, right? Okay, so this is one obvious uh, bound. Another obvious bound, uh, which uh, another immediate bound that you can get is maybe not that obvious, but still not hard to get. So now, n bar will be average nodal combinatorial degree. So the degree in the graph of a node, right? And this is just some uh, uh, topological identity. Chi is the Euler characteristic. So uh, total number of vertices minus edges plus faces is something uh, which is the Euler class. It's two for planar graphs. Uh, but for us, what matters is that E grows as V plus F if I let uh, the, num uh, the tiling grow. On the other hand, at every vertex, two edges meet combinator in a combinatorial sense. Uh, 
so no, I'm not saying that, uh, of course, more can meet. N bar meet typically, right? But uh, uh, this corresponds to two edges, right? Okay, so if I count all uh, the inter all the edges starting out, right, from a certain node, then I count every edge twice. That's why I have two e, and I have count the vertices n bar v times asymptotically, where n bar is the combinatorial degree. So two e has to grow as n bar times v, right? If I count along the edges, I count every node uh, twice. If I count along the vertices, I count every edge n bar times. So uh, these two have to scale like this. So taking all this into account, 2v plus f have to scale as n bar times v. This means uh, for me uh, that the ratio of the two quantities tends to one as uh, v tends to infinity. So I have uh, this sort of uh, scaling. Uh, and if I divide by v, I get this relation, right? Uh, which means that this combinatorial degree has to be at least three, uh, which means that y has to be at least x over two. Okay, so I'm, uh, oops. <laughs> okay, I'm above that uh, blue line, right? Okay, was it clear? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm above that blue line. Okay, so some more um, constraints. Uh, now let's sum up all internal ang angles of uh, cells. Okay, uh, I can do this in two different ways. One way is that uh, if I sum up internal angles of an M gone, I get M minus pi, M minus two times pi, right? This is something from high school or middle school, probably. So, uh, okay, now a typical cell is a Y minus one gone, right? Y was the average cell degree. So if I do this summation, I got F times Y minus one minus two, uh, which is N star because Y minus one was, so Y was uh, V over N star. Okay, so I get an N star minus two F times pi. This is one way of summing it up when viewed from the source. Okay, but I can also do that uh, by summing up along uh, the vertices. And here I distinguish between regular and irregular nodes. So this summation will put some constraint on the proportion of irregular nodes, right? So why? Because in this summation, if I have an irregular node, this contributes only by pi, because uh, at the irregular node, at the straight edge, you do not take into account the corner. Uh, why the regular ones contribute by two pi, right? Okay, so I get this relation. I have a irregular nodes times pi, plus regular is two pi, and I get two V minus VI times pi, and the two quantities have to scale the same way, meaning VI, the number of irregular nodes, scales as two V plus two F minus N star. Okay, and if uh, motivated by uh, X denoting the total number of nodes over N star, I introduce VI over N star for XI, right? Okay. Then if I divide this relation, I get that this xi, which is y after division 2x plus 2y minus 1, this has to be between 0 and x, right? Because xi cannot exceed x, right? Okay, it's the total number of nodes, total proportion of nodes, right? So we get these two constraints. On the one hand, x plus y is more than one half. This corresponds to xi being 0, and x plus 2 plus y cannot exceed a half. Right? This corresponds all nodes being irregular, right? Okay, so we get these two additional lines. Okay, so what we get here is this quadrilateral region. Uh, this is where all uh, planar balanced mosaics are located, right? Okay, um, let me mention this. This is another view of the same quadrilateral region. Okay, let me mention this that you may find that description as a bit crude. Why is it realistic? Let me mention that I heard a talk of a geologist, right, visiting Budapest, this particular group. And he mentioned the reason why they like this description is that when they make pictures, right, uh, these relations, whether a node is irregular or regular, these remain. So basically uh, what happens is that these relations are invariant under affine translations. 
what the picture makes. And that's why they can be counted on the pictures. That's why they like these sort of quantities. That's why they like it even when uh, making pictures from the planner system, from the Saturn or whatever, right? Uh, okay, so back to this uh, 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 quadrilateral region. So this is going to be our phase space, right? Basically, uh, at some point, right? Okay. Uh, this is another representation of the picture, right? Recall this corresponds to totally regular. Basically, horizontal lines correspond to a specific spatial degree, uh, cell degree, cell corner degree. So here on the top, uh, at this top corner, you have uh, the triangular lattice or something similar, right? Here at the bottom, you have the hexagonal lattice. These are the all regular lattices that you have right these are totally irregular lattices like this brick lattice here all nodes are irregular right and here you have something like this roof structure so this is how you should imagine regularity kind of uh, decreases from here to here right uh, cell degree de uh, in, uh, decreases from here to here right and uh, combinatorial degree of uh, uh, vertices uh, corresponds to lines going through the origin of a fixed slope, right? So this is our phase space. Yeah. Okay, so what is the evolution? And uh, what we'll have is a sort of evolution of the lattice, right? And uh, we want to have an evolution which is triggered by local random steps. So something happens locally in the mosaic, right? Uh, and this happens randomly, right? Okay. These are random steps that occur, right? Yet, we would like to track evolution on this uh, domain Q. So in the XY coordinates, right? Okay, how it affects the XY coordinates, these local steps. Okay, and what are the two types of time steps that we have, right? Uh, you could argue that uh, in nature, of course, other steps also arise, but let's see what these two natural steps, which are observed by geologists, uh, uh, how, how they, uh, what sort of evolution they uh, result in, right? Uh, so what are the two steps? One of them is uh, a secondary crack. I will stay at the end of the call. Why it's called secondary? But this is just saying that you pick a cell randomly and you break it into two along connecting two edges, right? Okay, it's broken, it's cracked into two pieces. And um, the other one, is a healing rearrangement when an irregular node of shape D uh, terms is transformed into a regular node of shape Y. Okay, so these are two. Here you see basically two healing rearrangements, right? Because both vertices have been rearranged from T to Y. Okay, good. Uh, so these are the two steps, and I use the letters T and H for that tail and hat, right? because uh, somehow I will choose randomly uh, between these two steps. Okay, so um, first let's see what, uh, uh, do, uh, do these, how these steps affect the macroscopic quantities. I will denote them by underline big X and star V and F, V and F, total number of vertices, total number of faces, and this thing cornered by multiplicity, this N star. And uh, how do they affect? Okay, so when you have a crack, uh, then you uh, increase the number of faces by one, right? Apparently, increase the number of vertices by two. Okay, good. And increase the number of, uh, in this N star by four, because these two edges appear as corners of both this cell and this cell, right? Okay, uh, while for a healing rearrangement, the only thing that changes, neither the total number of vertices nor the total number of faces, but what changes is just this n star, because for this polygon, this will become a, a true corner, right? So this is how it, uh, the quantities are affected, the macroscopic quantities are affected, okay. And now uh, the question is, how they affect the average quantities, the x and the y, which I'm gonna denote by little x, this is just a point in my domain Q, right? Okay, good. So uh, the first model that the two of them uh, set up 
was a discrete time evolution, right? Uh, and they were just said that, okay, uh, we have these two types of events. Let's just pick randomly at each step uh, by flipping a coin, a bias coin, which has a certain bias. So if it's a tail, which happens with a probability P, then I uh, do a crack. If it's a head, then I do a uh, healing rearrangement. Okay, so consecutive steps are randomly drawn uh, with these probabilities, and these are just independent coin tosses, right? So that's what I did. And uh, what they observed that, okay, uh, basically they could check what happens to a finite mosaic. Uh, they did some sort of uh, uh, approximation, averaging what happens to a large mosaic and counted uh, what happens to the increments of the uh, density type quantities. Well, as the mosaic grew, uh, the changes in these density quantities were smaller at each step. So after a long number of steps, what they observed, uh, was that they observed straight lines along this plane. Uh, and the problem was that uh, one of the problems with their model was that they could leave the domain Q, which is absolutely nonsense. But if uh, you think about it, that's not so much of a nonsense uh, because the model is not quite realistic. Why? Because there's no feedback from the state of the mosaic. So no matter how many uh, faces, how many irregular nodes are present, you can choose each type of steps with the same probability. That's not realistic. So uh, the goal was to design a model that incorporates this feedback from the state of the mosaic, right? And a model where this uh, transition from finite size to infinite size is properly uh, handled, right? Uh, because what do we expect? We expect that as we let the mosaic grow, there are more and more cells, there are more and more irregular nodes involved in my process. The process is going to accelerate. So this should, this acceleration should make the discrete time steps into something uh, which is continuous in time. Okay, so what is the model that uh, we came up with? Uh, this is demonstrated on this figure. So what we do, and this is probably something that you could also uh, figure out because it's a very natural choice, right? So what we do is that to each cell, we assign an exponential random variable, right? Which has a parameter lambda t. This is a constant, right? This lambda t. This is the local exponential parameter, the local frequency, right? And these are the uh, purple or blue clocks. And to each irregular node, we assign another type of exponential clock of local frequency lambda h, right? Okay, now you have these two types of clocks and you let them uh, ring. And whenever they ring, you let the crack or the heel happen, right? Okay. On top of the local frequencies, we'll also, uh, it will be also relevant how many clocks are involved of each type. So CT will be the number of clocks involved of cell type and CH will be the clocks of irregular type involved. Okay, so this is what we do. And let's see what it gives, right? So just to recall, we have the X bar, which are these global quantities. We have the little X, so the big X, which are the global quantities and the little X, which are the local quantities, right? And there are two types of events, the crack and the heel events. The crack events, which are triggered by faces of the mosaic, the heel events, which are triggered by the irregular nodes in my mosaic. And there are the local frequencies. These are constants, lambda T and lambda H, right? And uh, well, what's going to be really relevant is the ratio of the two frequencies, the mu, right? Lambda H, uh, which is just a general scaling parameter, it's just going to speed the uh, scale the speed of the process, right? Okay, so this is less relevant. How many, num how many clocks do I have of each type? Well, uh, CT, the number of 
crack clocks is just the number of faces, right? Because each face can uh, crack into two. And CH, this is going to be scaled by uh, the number of irregular nodes. And we had this relation back some time ago, right? Okay. Now, there's a global rate. Because if you add up all these uh, Boisson random variables, basically, uh, then you get the total number of uh, crack events, which is random, and which happens with this global rate, number of clocks times the local rate, and the same for the healing, right? Okay, so how you can view this? You can also view this that you have a Poisson process of intensity F, which is the number of the global rate, the sum of the global rates, and whenever a clock goes off, it can be of crack or hill type with probability ratio of frequencies. So this is a very standard object, if you would. It's just a standard Poisson process colored into two uh, different types, right? Okay, so this is kind of the thing that you have, uh, a Poisson process with global uh, intensity F, which can be of this type, PT or PH, right? Okay. So to proceed, uh, let me also introduce this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so you will see from my result that uh, this is kind of a snapshot. Uh, and when I do the limit, it corresponds to a fixed time. Yeah. Uh, so we do not have results for time intervals. We just have a result for a fixed time. And when I do this, I have a control of the geometry, right? Uh, this is, of course, uh, an important question, how to uh, extend the result uh, to finite time intervals, right? But you will see how my result is stated, that there, this control is there, because I'm just having a snapshot, right? But you are perfectly right. Yeah? OK. Uh, so um, yeah. Uh, I also introduced these little gamma quantities, which are, so these Fs, the global rates, scaled with big X. So the larger the mosaic was, the more uh, faces, cells, and star it had, the larger this F, and I rescaled by n star. So this is something that depends only on uh, the uh, densities on the little x, right? Okay, and I also introduced some expected growth of the different quantities, right? Of the big axis, right? Because how was that? So we had these possible increments at the different type of events uh, for the microscopic quantities. Thus, the expected growth can be computed if this happens with probability PT and probability PH, I just can't compute the expected growth. But uh, important to point out that all these gammas and nus, right, they depend on the densities, right? Uh, because they depend on the, uh, the presence of the different type of uh, quantities that we have, right? Okay, so, so here's the result. And this is maybe uh, an answer to your question. So let's assume that we're given a specific time t and we have a balanced mosaic with a certain type of density characteristics, okay? And then at time dt, a little bit later, this bold means that the state is random because it has evolved according to this random process. Uh, this will be the bold x, y, right? The bold underline x. Okay, and now this is the important scaling regime that we have. We let time go to zero, right? And at the same time, we uh, increase our observation window. We consider larger and larger part of the mosaic in such a way that d squared, which is the aspect of uh, the observed area, scales faster than dt shrinks, right? Okay, so this is a typical Poisson type limit right? dt goes to zero, d goes to infinity, such that dt times d squared goes to infinity, right? Okay. And then this is what we have. Uh, we have that these random increments over the time converge in probability to something deterministic. This is the averaging that we have, right? Okay. 
which is dx over dt, dy over dt, I can consider them now making a level of abstraction, which would be rigorous if I had this result for not just for a fixed time, but also for simultaneously for an interval, right? But at least uh, at this specific time, they converge to these differential uh, differentials, which are deterministic quantities. Okay, so it's a law of large numbers type observation, which can be expressed in terms of these uh, gammas and nus and whatever. So these local frequencies rescaled and uh, expected grosses rescaled. Okay. So this is what we have, okay? At a specific time, conversion in probability of the difference ratios to something. And now from that point, you make a logical jump, right? And you say that you can study these ODE, right? For what X and Y does, right? Okay. Uh, these X hat and Y hat, which appear in the formulas, these are ratios of uh, expected values, right? Okay, so this is what we have. Okay, so how does it go? And you could probably figure this out from what I uh, said, how it goes, but let's see. Okay, so this is my observation window. This is of size d squared, era d squared, uh, which is of the radius d, right? And these crosses are the clocks that are involved, right? And the total number of clocks that I observe is proportional to n star, basically, because both uh, one scales with f, which is proportional to n star via x. Okay, okay, this is okay. This is not the same as the tilde. Tilde means uh, the ratio of the two uh, scales to one. This means that one is little big O of the other, and uh, the other is big O of the one. So the ratio of the quantities is two between two constants, which depend on the geometry of the mosaic, but uh, are bounded uh, from below and above uh, from infinite and zero respectively, right? So this is what we have, right? And then I add time, right? So the vertical axis is time. Uh, so along each of these clocks, I see a timeline and some of them goes off. This is the red dot, right? So the total number of events, which I'm going to denote by xi, the total number of events that grow off in this time interval dt within the observation window, this is going to be a Poisson random variable with f times dt, where f was the global rate, right? But f is gamma times n star, because that's how we rescaled. So gamma is something of order one, n star dt is something that tends to infinity. So you have a Poisson random variable, a sequence of Poisson random variables, which tends to infinity, right? With parameter tending to infinity. Okay, you may notice that I'm cheating a little bit. Why? Do you see why? So a little cheat is that when a clock goes off, the geometry of the mosaic changes, right? So actually beyond that red dot, there's no purple line, right? Because uh, the irregular node has disappeared or the face has changed. So each time I see a dot, the geometry changes, the total number of clocks, the structure of clocks changes, but these are second order effects, right? Because uh, to have two consecutive dots along a line, this is, is probably the d squared, right? So these are lower order in magnitude, okay? So uh, this is the leading order picture, right? But there are effects which are still there, which you have to somehow treat, uh, but uh, this is the leading order picture. That's what I'm saying, right? Okay, okay. Moreover, these uh, clocks can be of two types, the ear crack event clocks or heel event clocks, right? Uh, the orange ones are the one and the blue ones are the other, right? Okay. So for this reason, I have this colored Poisson process in eating order. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we have. And then a Cree quantity in the argument is xi, the expected number of events, right? xi, which 
is gamma n star d this distance to infinity. Okay, the expected number of events in my observation window distance to infinity. I'll denote by n delta the increment. This is random because at the end of the day, n star after the random increment will be a random quantity. Okay, and I can introduce same random in, in uh, increment for faces and vertices. And the key lemma is this, and delta, which is random, rescaled by xi, which tends to infinity, distance in probability to the expected growth per event, nu zero. Okay, uh, and the same for the other type. So why is that true, this lemma? That's because uh, you have an increment of the tail type whenever a tail clock, uh, clock goes off, an increment of heel type whenever a heel clock grows off. Okay. And as psi over xi tends to one, this is just a standard property of a Poisson, right? If you let the Poisson variable parameter go to infinity, then you have this convergence in probability. Actually, you also have it in other senses, but that's just for this one. Okay. And then uh, you have this uh, uh, simul similar behavior for the tail top wise and the heel clock uh, type events, just because I rescale by the total expectation, I converge not to one, but to PT, the probability of the tail event and the probability of the heel event. And then you just combine and you get this result, right? For the increment, okay? So the increment in N star is the expected increment. That's what it says, okay? And once you have this, you have, of course, the same behavior for the other type of quantities. And then uh, this is a computation. How much time do I have? 12 minutes. Okay, good. So I can go over this uh, little computation. Uh, remember, we're after the increment in x, which is this ratio, v over n star. Okay. So this is just uh, taking a little bit of algebra, right? Okay. And then you see uh, that we have some cancellations. So after taking the common denominator, I have a V delta N star minus V N delta and dividing across N star, I arrive at this quantity, right? Okay. And then I just uh, take a factor gamma out. Why do I do that? Uh, just because I want to divide all this by dt so that xi will appear, right? Okay, which is the uh, expected number of events. So, but I have that x at t plus dt minus xt over dt. From now on, let me talk about the OD that I get this way for x and y, right? So this is a logical step because I only have it for a time. It's a jump. Uh, because I only have it for a fixed time, and now I pretend as if I knew it for an interval, right? Okay. So this is the system of the ODE that we have, right? And now you could fill in actually the original model that they had, because what did they do? What they did uh, that they just applied the steps irrespective of the state of the mosaic with probability p one with probably one minus p the other, right? That was the original model that Gabor and Christina had. So what does that mean? That none of these quantities that appear in this uh, OD, none of the parameters are state dependent, right? And you just have a linear OD, right? And then the trajectories are lines on the plane, uh, which have a limit point x at y hat, and depending on the parameters, this particle limit point may lie outside the domain Q. Q. So uh, that's how you get back their uh, observation, right? With this feedback. So this way, their model is incorporated in this new model, right? Okay, what happens if I uh, consider the feedback model? I get something nonlinear because then these things will depend on the state of the mosaic right on the x and the y okay recall we have these local rates lambda h times and mu times lambda h and mu 
is an important parameter. It's the ratio of the two local frequencies, right? And then I can compute gamma x. What was that? It was the global rate rescaled by n star, basically by the size of the mosaic. And you see these uh, rescaled global rates are now state dependent, right? Uh, so you arise this gamma, which is the total global rate as a gamma t plus a gamma h, right? Which are the rates for the two different types. Okay. So I think I'm just uh, flashing up this computation. This is straightforward. You just plug in the data and then you arrive at this OD. Yeah. Okay. This is no longer linear. This is quadratic, right? For dx over dt and dy over dt. You arrive at this OD. And you can study this OD, what it does, right? So first observation is that you can check that for this OD, this domain Q of balanced mosaics that I introduced at the beginning is invariant. So you never leave it, right? Because what happens is that when you're approaching the boundary, it means that the total number of irregular nodes has shrank, okay? So for this reason, uh, this type of process slows down and that's why you cannot leave it, right? Okay, so these are the trajectories of this ODE. Uh, for every mu, you have a limit point, which is actually on this edge, right? Okay, of my domain, yeah? You see the different cases. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between limit point and parameter mu, ratio of the frequencies, right? And the limit points are always on that line, uh, which is uh, this segment, y equals x over two, and x runs between one half and a third, okay? So this is a comparison of the linear and the nonlinear model. Uh, in the linear case, you ha might have such a trajectory. In the nonlinear one, you have such a trajectory, right? Uh, what you see in these pictures is that, uh, remember these two photos were mod crack patterns that I started with. Okay, what you can do is that you fit the parameter mu respectively p of the two models uh, such that you find the trajectory that connects these two models. And there's one point where the two models agree, namely uh, the hierarchy of the two uh, pictures. So both of them say that you can evolve from, what's that? Okay, yeah, I think here we were. Uh, you can evolve from this point to that point, but not back, right? Uh, however, uh, this one has a limit point outside the domain and the nonlinear one has a limit point on the boundary of my domain, right? Okay, so just one more thing, uh, still about the limit points, right? what we have. So they are always on that line segment. Uh, so recall what this line segment meant. This means combinatorial degree three, right? That's how I defined this boundary, right? But this is obvious that that's how it should be because uh, when you make a crack, right? A secondary crack, you create a three degree node an irregular one. And when you heal a T to a Y, you keep the combinatorial degree three. So with the cracking and the healing, you only create three degree nodes. So after some time, you will only have three degree nodes, uh, except the original ones, but the new ones are always three degree, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, let me also uh, tell you what X mu is. So what actually the limit point is in terms of mu and just an observation, what was X mu? This was average combinatorial corner degree, right? Average corner degree over one, right? And this turns out to be three times one over mu plus one, but two times mu over mu plus one. So what does that mean? This means that we are in a stationary situation such that with rate mu, I create uh, irregular nodes. And with rate one, 
I heal them, right? Okay. And uh, this is what uh, this uh, results in, such sort of a mixture, right? Okay. So we are in a stationary state of this uh, Markov process, if you, if you want to view it this way, right? Okay. So that's how you cannot interpret the limit points. Okay. So uh, just uh, to conclude, I talked about an evolution model, uh, which is based on this uh, local events, which are triggered by exponential clocks, right? Uh, and uh, for the average quantities uh, in this limit, we kind of arrived a snapshot for an ODE, right? That's what we had. Okay, so what extensions are there? So uh, in our preprint, uh, we actually discussed all this in a slightly more general framework in which have, we have more local quantities, more global quantities. It's not hard to uh, put it in a more general framework. Uh, so you could involve further types of local events. So I talked about heel and secondary crack. So why is it secondary? So there's something which is called a primary crack by these geologists. So that's when you should think of a large surface uh, which is broken along a long line, right? Which cracks several faces, right? So this one creates uh, nodes of higher degree, right? These are the primary cracks. So this is what I was told geologists observe that they see these large cracks. These are the primary ones. And once those large cracks have been heated, there are cross cracks between uh, these large lines, right? These are the secondary cracks. So there's a, a possibility of incorporating these primary cracks, which would result in limit points elsewhere uh, on my domain of mosaics, right? You could also add additional density type quantities. You could think of higher dimensional situations, right? Why not? Uh, which are characterized by, instead of two quantities, more quantities, right? And of course, uh, it would be nice to have a more detailed description of the process. So not just to have it uh, for a snapshot, but also for an interval, right? Okay. Uh, on top of that, on top of these quantities, it would be interesting to understand what these processes are to the geometry. So uh, the way I describe, it's kind of clear that this has some sort of self-similar structure. So, because uh, what you see in a certain domain, you zoom out a certain domain, you see the same probabilities occurring there. Okay, somehow, right? Because uh, the probabilities do not really scale with the era, they scale with the number of clocks there, right? So what you expect that it, if there's a, some sort of acceleration cracks at a certain spot, then, uh, it's going to uh, create some uneven but self-similar patterns. So uh, actually I was told that on the surface of Mars, which is kind of uh, untouched, there's no human intervention, uh, but can be observed to a large extent, they do observe such self-similar structures. I was told by this uh, geologist. You, you may be interested in taking a look at his webpage. His name is Jack. Uh, Doug Gerald Mack uh, and University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. He gave a very nice talk on these things and the nice pictures. Okay, but you could also introduce some sort of scale dependent parameters or things like that. Yeah, so these are all possible directions of continuation. But now thank you for your attention. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Uh, since I have what? Of course, yeah, of course. It would be very interesting to look at fluctuations. Yeah, this is certainly a low of large numbers picture, right? So I don't know. This is another interesting direction. I don't know, yeah. I think it's a very interesting, uh, uh, this is just the first uh, preliminary study. Yeah? Another question I have is, um, are there any questions that geologists are interested in how to solve the problem? Yeah, so uh, 
I know that this guy uh, who visited uh, was really enthusiastic about this evolution model. So what structures can be observed and such like. Uh, so yeah, I think so, but I'm not, uh, not sure about this. I know that, for example, what sort of limits you can have. I, I uh, had this quadrilateral region and uh, what they see is that uh, the structures that they observe either on the earth or in the planetary system are not even on this quadrilateral region. So they uh, are located, for example, in the lower triangle, right? Uh, and uh, this is something that maybe by including uh, the third step of primary cracks, you could explain. But if you have these three types of steps, uh, the limit points are in this lower triangle and not in the upper one. Okay, so for example, something like that, or this hierarchy question. So uh, you have two snapshots, which is older, right? Which one's older? You observe something in the, uh, which, which pattern is older, uh, which could evolve from the other. So uh, if I go back to this uh, figure, Yeah, uh, this is saying that if you feed the parameters, both for the linear and the nonlinear, it says that this can evolve to that, but not the other way around. So this is something that geologists uh, might find interesting. Is it possible to go from one to the other, Bernardi? Uh, so some sort of hierarchy. So such questions, right? So I think there's. Uh... Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, so uh, I think that there's uh, there's uh, something about the physical process and these steps. Uh, so I've seen papers which involve some tangents and uh, some physical description of similar type of steps. Okay, so for example, these healing rearrangements uh, sort of uh, correspond to, to uh, the cell trying to reach a more even shape like these Voronoi cells, uh, which, uh, which you get by tiling in a way that you have points and you create the cells uh, as closest to a certain point given in a lattice, right? Uh, so I've seen such uh, pictures, but I don't know uh, uh, how they relate. Uh, those papers were mostly numerical. So well, that's what I seen, that they had some physical process and the description of the evolution was mostly numerical. So this is much simpler, uh, but uh, there, there, do, there, there are physical principles behind these steps, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. So maybe, but if you have some references or. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. So welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, this is Wild Matsun, and he's going to tell us about mean mean field, field couple, and also maps. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, Okay, so uh, I start with the uh, setting. Uh, so uh, I'm going to have uh, uh, Anosov map, which is uh, CR. And I'm going to assume R uh, bigger than or equal to four for technical reasons that 
won't appear in the presentation probably, and transitive. Okay, so some notation, uh, curly M1 of M, this is the set of uh, probability measures. And uh, I need uh, a diffeomorphism. How do I write the notation? Epsilon mu. And this is CR diffu. And where epsilon is some number, real number and mu is a probability measure. Okay. Um, with so at epsilon equals zero, this is just the identity map. And what I want to consider, I want to consider the uh, following uh, perturbation of T. So I define T composed with uh, phi epsilon nu, and I call this T epsilon nu. All right, so um, such a perturbation, uh, can be uh, interpreted as a, a globally uh, coupled map or mean field uh, coupled map in the thermodynamic limit. So this is uh, just interpretation. This is uh, globally coupled or mean field in the thermodynamic limit yeah. with coupling strength, so side dynamics T e, uh, state uh, of the system mu and coupling strength Epsilon. All right, if you know what's this stuff, good. Uh, if you don't know, um, you don't have to uh, think about the interpretation. Yeah. Um, I didn't assume anything. I did not assume anything yet. But I'll give you an example and I'll tell you what are my assumptions. Okay. All what I want to say that I'm, I'm considering uh, perturbations which depend on two things, on a real number and on a measure, probability measure. All right, so an example. So this is on the torus. And I uh, let us consider uh, phi epsilon nu at x to be x plus the integral. And here I put a smooth kernel and a smooth density. And this is dy, and I always forget the epsilon. Now I wrote it. Okay, this is an example. Okay, so you can think uh, of perturbations of this type and such perturbations, as you see, they are state dependent. They depend on you, yes? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I did not tell you yet. So,
Thank you. Uh, this is an example. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Okay, good. So, um, assumptions. I'm not going to say the assumptions explicitly, but think of this example. So, I want um, uh, perturbations which uh, vary uh, in a nice way. If I fix epsilon and vary uh, mu, yeah, I get uh, a nice regularity in appropriate topology, which I don't want to mention now. Yeah. And the same thing if I fix mu and I change epsilon, this also varies nicely in a nice topology, which I don't want to mention now at least. All right, but you know, you can think of this uh, example here and the general assumptions are very similar to what the, this example satisfies, okay? Right, so in particular, the assumptions, and you can look at this, uh, imply, so the assumptions on uh, phi imply there exists an epsilon zero positive such that uh, for all epsilon smaller than epsilon zero, this map which uh, I defined is and also uh, um, defined on the same on the same com field as T. Okay, so this is very important. What I'm saying here as maps, all these maps, uh, they are small perturbations of my original Anosov and they are Anosov uh, with uniform uh, contraction and expansion. Uh, here in this example, take it to be C infinity. Take this guy also to be C infinity or CR or whatever, you know, but very small. Right, so this is the um, setting and we want to study statistics. Uh, this means uh, push forward of measures, so if the current state of the system is mu. I want to know what will be uh, the next state. So I push forward mu. Let's put mu zero. Then I get a new state. And in general, what I want to look at is the following. So this is the new state of the system. So let's say um, in state n minus one, I push it forward to get the state new n, okay? And the usual thing, well, we call a measure invariant If it's invariant, let's put okay. Uh, as in Classical dynamics, we are interested um, in uh, where? 
ah, here. Uh, uh, this is mu. Uh, this is the mu and this is the epsilon. Ah, oh yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so as in classical uh, dynamics, uh, we will be interested in a particular, um, uh, so we call um, an invariant measure physical. If for some mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag, if we push forward this measure, so uh, and Okay, so this is the uh, push forward of, of this guy. And let's call it. And then take the limit as n goes to infinity. This converges to new bar epsilon weekly. Okay. So if we start from um, a state which has a density with respect to the bag at, and it converges to a, an invariant uh, measure, we call such a measure a physical measure. So what's the main uh, statement uh, of, of our work is the following uh, theorem. This is so for sufficiently uh, small uh, epsilon, the system has a unique physical measure. Okay, um, in order to uh, prove this theorem, um, I have to first uh, introduce transfer operators and prove another theorem. And I'll tell you that this one is done by approximation. Okay, so um, transfer operators. Maybe I start. No, I said that we call an invariant measure physically if for some, yeah, yeah, for some, yeah. If it's for all, then uniqueness will be, yeah, I mean, the definition, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, just uh, for some, yeah. Yeah, similar. Uh, as in the classical case. So what do you say? You say, if I um, have a measure which uh, describes uh, um, a large set of initial conditions statistically, then I call the measure physical. This is similar. Okay. Okay, so uh, transfer operators. OK. 
So these will be um, again acting on anisotropic Banach spaces. Okay. On which I don't want to define now, but I will define at the end of the talk, all right? But I'll give them names so that we don't get lost in the middle of the Banach spaces. So these will be denoted by uh, Bt, V2q, which is contained in V1q, contained in V0q, so three Banach spaces, and q, is um, from one up to R minus one. R is the uh, regularity of the map. So these, this Q will um, play the role uh, later. We'll see how many derivatives we take in the uh, stable direction. Okay. Um, so for H in B0Q, we define uh, the following transfer operator, which is in this business, it's called the uh, self-consistent transfer operator, which is defined like this. So I consider the transfer operator similar to what I saw in the push forward. So this is epsilon state H and I push forward H. So unlike so where L T epsilon H is the transfer usual transfer operator of the map. However, unlike um, this transfer operator, which is a linear transfer operator, as you can see from the push forward. And here, this definition, this operator is nonlinear. Okay. This is different. Okay. So, not unlike T epsilon, oops, L of T epsilon. H L hat epsilon is nonlinear. Okay, um, so um, uh, although we have one operator, we it's nonlinear, so there's no spectral theory, but one can still do uh, something. How do we use these uh, transfer operators? So we use them to um, uh, prove uh, the following theorem. Okay. So another thing to note from the uh, definition of invariant measure that um, L hat epsilon H let me put epsilon here and maybe some star to make it uh, visible. If this is a fixed point, then this is an invariant measure. So uh, since we don't have um, a spectral theory, well, uh, we are looking for a fixed point. Well, there are fixed point techniques. 
uh, fixed point theorems, uh, which uh, we can uh, use. Uh, but uh, what we want, uh, we want uh, not only a fixed point, but a unique one. Uh, we want this uh, unique fixed point to be attracting okay. some rate, hopefully. Okay, so let me define, uh, give notation. So what do we do? We define uh, um, um, a set. Uh, so let's uh, define, uh, so let k uh, first be uh, a positive number. And I define some uh, set, which is subset of now, um, maybe I say something about the Banach spaces, this uh, the notation B1, and here I take Q plus one, and I, I explain later why I put uh, Q plus one here. Um, let me say something about the Banach spaces before, uh, I proceed, I mean, why, why I took uh, directly the uh, set that I want to show that it's invariant to be a subset of uh, uh, this B1Q, not of the first one. Uh, the big space uh, B0Q, if you look at the uh, transfer operator of the Anosov map, it won't have a spectral gap on uh, the B0Q, but on B1Q, we get a spectral gap. Uh, so therefore here, since I want to uh, show that I have uniqueness and uh, contraction, so I have to work with this more uh, regular Banach space. And why the um, 2Q? Well, I'd like my uh, measure to have uh, also additional uh, regular properties, which I need in my proof, okay? So, uh, this set, uh, you can think of it, of course, it depends on Q and its subset of this with some condition on uh, elements here, how, you know, a band on their uh, 2Q norm. Yeah. And the theorem, so there exists a, a K minimum such that, for all k bigger than k minimum and epsilon small. So first thing, um, L hat epsilon has a unique Fixed point, let's give it a name, uh, H, okay, in, uh, how did I call this set? And the second thing, uh, there exists a C, which depends on K, and gamma, in zero one, such that uh, for any H in the set, gamma to the N. All right. Uh, so the idea, as I said, is um, um, once you prove uh, a theorem like this, uh, this theorem one is proved by approximation. Uh, so you can take something uh, which approximates your uh, L1 function, hit it, and then you put it in this, in this uh, set eventually, and you, you get the convergence, basically like this, but uh, gamma depends on K, no, but uh, the constant 
dc depends on k. Okay. So let me give you an idea. Since uh, many people in the audience, they uh, work with uh, sequential dynamical systems and random dynamical systems, I give you an idea about the proof. And this is uh, basically, um, it has some sequential uh, dynamical system in, in the background. So, all right, so uh, the, uh, how do we do the proof? Well, uh, the first thing, well, first thing, idea of proof. Uh, well, you show that uh, the set is invariant. Fine. Okay. And uh, then since this is nonlinear operator, so if I take, say, two elements, so then let H1, H2 be elements of this set. And I want to show that I get a contraction. There's N, H1. Okay. If I look at the uh, definition of uh, my push forward, which I introduced earlier, yeah, and now I translate this to my transfer operators here, I can write a sequential representation of this transfer operator. So in particular, I can write, uh, let me do this in few steps. So the first thing you say, okay, I can write this as L, let us start with the first one. So this is L T epsilon, and this is uh, H1. And then I compose with L T epsilon, and this is H11, and what do I mean by H11? So this is the pushed forward um, a measure that I got from this guy, from H1, and then I get the second one, and eventually this is T epsilon H1 and minus one. Okay, so this is for this guy. This is my sequential representation for this transfer operator. And now I do the same thing for H2. H2, uh, no, what do I put? Yeah, two, and this is H2. Okay, uh, now once I fix my sequences, I can play things which, uh, you know, I can play with this uh, as, if, as if I have uh, a linear operator, right? I mean, once you fix the sequence, this is, you know, I fix this if you want realization, and now I can apply it to the measure that I want. Okay, so, so the proof uh, goes really by induction and uh, what you do you split this uh, into two parts um, one part you say okay fine i take um, uh, uh, the uh, two different sequences but i apply to the same uh, measure and then in the other part i take um, the same sequence applied to the difference of these two measures okay Okay, so mm -hmm. 
apply to uh, say H1. And now I do the same thing, but with the, the second sequence. applied to H1. So this is the first. And the second thing is I take this sequence now Okay, so what's uh, the situation here? Well, here I have a zero mean. And since, uh, as I told you, in this uh, Banach space, the transfer operator of my original Anosov map, it has a spectral gap. So I can prove a lemma that uh, since all these maps are Anosov, I get exponential memory loss. Okay, so this takes care of this part. Now for this part here, what do you do? You usually write this as a telescoping sum. Okay, so you write this as telescoping sum. And this is where the induction uh, takes place. And you can pull out uh, epsilon. This is thanks to the assumptions that we put on the coupling. Uh, I pull out an epsilon because here I'm um, um, uh, fixing epsilon and I'm varying H. So I, pu I pull out an epsilon. And with uh, the choice of epsilon being small, I recover the constant that I had in my induction state. Okay, so this is the idea of, of the uh, proof. Good. Uh, let me tell you how much time do I have? 15 minutes, okay, good. So uh, this is the story about uh, this mean field coupling, but let me tell you about the Banach spaces now. What are these Banach spaces? Mm -hmm. So the Banach spaces. So I'm going to be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, we need the, these, these Banach spaces, they are um, geometric in nature. So this is, uh, you know, this is joint work with the uh, Liverani. So as you know, it's the same kind of uh, philosophy and uh, the uh, Banach spaces are um, of geometrical type, yeah? All right, so uh, W will denote um, a CR foliation of uh, my uh, manifold. Um, and I want to stress right from the beginning when I say foliation here, this is not the invariant foliation by the dynamics. Yeah, the invariant foliation is not in this class actually. Okay, so this is W is a CR foliation of M, which is adapted to the cone field of T. And I need and uh, phi will be uh, my notation for a test function, CR test function. And what do I need more? So first uh, we want to define uh, norms for uh, the test function with a foliation. So phi, uh, uh, Q and W, this is equal. Okay, so 
let me take a point on the manifold. I'm going to uh, ignore charts and xi, I can write it as xy. This is for uh, the um, unstable, the variable in, in the unstable direction. And uh, this is the uh, variable in the stable direction. So what we do, uh, we compose phi with the full foliation. This is the representation of the uh, foliation. And we fix the unstable direction and keep the uh, stable direction free. And then we take the CQ norm of this, soup over X, and then soup over Xi. Okay. This is for uh, test functions. And now we want to define a, a class of foliations with a test functions. So I want them to, my foliations to be uh, regular, but uh, in a sense, uniformly regular. Okay. Um, okay, so class, so this will be denoted, this class will be denoted by omega and it has uh, three uh, subscripts. So the big L is for the uniform regularity. Q is the number of derivatives that I take in the stable direction. And L is either one or D. So one, if I have a real uh, value test function and D if I have a, a vector value uh, test function, okay? And uh, so I say, Uh, a foliation and a test function uh, are in this class. If the foliation is uh, regular, but its regularity is controlled by L, okay? And with this norm, uh, smaller than one. All right, so this is for test functions. And then now when, when I define the uh, Banach space uh, norms, these are um, easy. They are very similar to L1 and BV in, you know, whenever you don't have a stable foliation. So this is uh, the weak norm, H0Q. Uh, so I take say, uh, first you do this with functions. I'm going to be quick now, soup. Uh, W and uh, uh, phi in uh, this set, L, Q, and one here. And I do H phi. And then I define as, so this is very similar to uh, L1. I'm integrating over the whole manifold. And then uh, we define a semi-norm, which is similar to uh, BV. This is one uh, Q, and you take a soup W phi in um, omega L. I need one more. Uh, how you define BV when, when you know, in, in higher dimension. But here we have a foliation, and then uh, maybe with some cheating, I just say H1Q uh, is uh, some fixed number, H0Q plus uh, H1Q uh, star. All right. Uh, just to say something before I um, um, define B B uh, uh, 2Q, well, if needed. Uh, let me go back to the uh, proof. So, well, one question which uh, one may ask, well, why did you do this uh, with um, 1Q plus one and why don't you do it with uh, the zero Q? So the first thing I said, well, in the zero Q norm, we don't get uh, 
uh, a contraction. Why do you need the uh, this other space, this B B two Q norm? Usually, when you do continuity in this business, well, uh, you do the continuity from uh, uh, strong to weak. Yeah, so uh, you need your uh, distribution or your function to be uh, regular enough, and then you measure uh, the continuity in a weaker norm. So I start from the 2Q and then I go to the 1Q plus one norm, because again, once we do this measurement, we need one extra derivative. All right, and uh, uh, that's it. Basically, I can also define the uh, 2Q norm if you are interested. If you're not interested, I can tell you about literature in this business if I have time. Do you have time? Do I have time? Okay, sure. So, uh, so some literature, So this is uh, for smooth uh, expanding maps of the circle. Uh, the first work uh, in this uh, business, as you see the flavor, this is uh, by uh, Keller in 2000. And uh, Keller basically uh, proved uh, a theorem which is in the flavor only of theorem two. Okay, well, when you work with the expanding mass, uh, you don't have these uh, weird spaces. So if you say I have an invariant set and I get this um, exponential conversions, uh, maybe maybe it's enough. Yeah, but uh, if you're working with uh, uh, these Banach spaces and just, you just say you know I have. Uh, exponential contraction in these uh, uh, um, sophisticated uh, Banach spaces, then uh, the question is maybe, so what? What does it tell me? You know, what do I see? And that's why uh, we needed this notion of physical measure and to prove theorem one. And a follow-up uh, of this paper is by Peter. And Keller, and Shaley, and Toth, uh, where uh, they again proved a, a theorem in the, in the uh, same flavor as uh, theorem two here for expanding circle maps still. They got uh, probably more general coupling uh, and also they uh, proved some regularity about uh, the invariant state, which we also get in our case, in the Anosov case. So still, uh, uh, Galatolo, and this is in 2022, uh, where uh, again proved the uh, he considered um, an abstract framework uh, with applications to uh, circle maps in the flavor of theorem two, and also with applications to random systems. Okay, so uh, finally, or almost finally, uh, uh, in the case of uh, Interm intermittent mittent maps. Uh, a recent work by uh, myself and uh, Alexei where, uh, so this is in the flavor say of theorem two. And this is, we did theorem one and theorem two with appropriate rates.
Okay, and if you're interested in uh, uh, this topic and its connections to some applications, you can uh, see uh, the uh, survey article by Matteo Penzi. And this is in so review. And this is posted on archive in 22. Okay, and that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what we proved, actually we proved that this is uh, Lipschitz in the 1Q norm. Um, can we get linear response? I think yes. Uh, at least at zero, at epsilon equals zero, we can, I believe we can differentiate. And, you know, I was talking to Carlangelo recently, he said, why didn't we do this? I said, maybe laziness. So. <laughs> well, uh, uniformly expanding maps uh, in higher dimension, you mean smooth, right? Okay, so I think the result will not be um, uh, more different than what you saw in the annals of case. Just take the take away the stable direction. Yeah. And you can work with nice spaces. And I'm not saying that these spaces are not nice, but. Uh, yeah. Ah, but, uh, not yet, nothing. But you, you know, like once you start to consider discontinuities and singularities, even perturbations, uh, you know, uh, usual deterministic or, or random perturbations, things get ugly, right? I mean, you have to put more assumptions for things to work. I mean, if you want to prove uniqueness, for example, of, uh, of um, an invariant measure, and uh, yeah, and that things vary in a nice way, so. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'd like to uh, start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, so th this is a, a joint work with uh, Mike and Anne Christina. And uh, actually, I chose it because it's uh, right in this intersection between uh, the study of uh, functional limit theorems for the sums and also uh, extreme value theory, okay? Which is something that uh, Ian and uh, Matt have been work for a while now. Right, so, um, so let me start with uh, the setting. So we just consider a dynamical system defined on a, a compact manifold equipped with some norm with its Borel sigma algebra and let T be a measurable map and mu it's a uh, invariant measure, okay? So our goal is to study stochastic processes arising from this system simply by evaluating an observable function that we take in RD, although my pictures will be all in with D equal to one, okay? Um, but the theory can be done actually in, in multi-dimensional uh, spaces. And then we compose with the dynamics, okay? Right, so in the um, uh, good setting, and by good setting, we, I mean when we have nice systems with nice decay correlations um, and nice observable functions, and by nice observable functions, I mean square integrable functions, then typically, one falls into the central limit regime, which means that if you consider sums or Bifkov sums, and if you normalize them, then typically one observes a convergence to a Brownian motion, okay? So this is the 1D picture here, which of course uh, gives you the central limit theorem by simply going there and put the one T equal to one, okay? So that's what 
typically happens. There are lots of authors here, so I decided not to cite anybody because it would be a very long, long list. Anyway, so um, one can uh, spoil this by either considering bad systems or uh, bad observables. So here, uh, for the purpose of this talk, will be mostly, uh, well, uh, entirely uh, uh, dedicated to uh, bad observables. And by bad observable, I mean uh, heavy tailed observables. Okay. So this means that I have this uh, sort of behavior here on the tail of this uh, uh, function psi. Okay. Um, and so this means that when one studies now big of sums, again, um, one, find, uh, one can still find normalizing sequences, assuming that we have some nice system, of course. And uh, uh, the limit now is going to be a bit different because it's going to be a levy flight, an alpha stable level uh, levy uh, process, where uh, the main difference here is the fact that one has jumps. Okay. And these jumps essentially appear because since we have some heavy tail uh, behavior, then there, are, there is a more higher likelihood of observing very high observations, which are the resp uh, responsible for uh, creating these jumps. Okay. So this will be the setting. And for this setting and for the purpose of this talk, uh, one of the main models we will use uh, is uh, the Poisson point process. Okay, so let me from the beginning tell you what by, we mean by uh, a Poisson random measure or Poisson point process. So we consider, um, so in this case, I show a bi dimensional one. Uh, so basically, one takes the Dirac measure and one uh, uh, charges points uh, uh, in such a way that. Uh, well, we get a, a random distribution of points in the plane in this case. And the main features are when one considers a, a set, then the number of points that fall into this set follows a Poisson distribution with some intensity measure mu. They are all independent. Okay. Right. Okay. So, uh, how does um, the Poisson uh, point process relates with the Levy process? Well, because of the Levy to representation. Okay, so this is a nice formula that tells you. So here is a picture of this formula for the alpha stable Levy process. And basically, um, one can write the um, Levy process as an integral of a Poisson. A random measure. Okay, so here depicted here is a, a Poisson random measure like that, where uh, the ti and pi uh, give you these points according to an intensity measure that here is Lebesgue on the horizontal direction and new alpha on the vertical direction. And new alpha is what we call the Levy measure, which is uh, again as this heavy tailed. Uh, kind of formula. Okay. So um, basically, by integrating this, you get this picture. And so there are lots of points here near the zero. So these are the parts you see here. And then sometimes you see there's a big observation, and that causes this big jump here. Okay. Right. So the point is that understanding this. Uh, uh, Poisson processes leads you to understanding um, the Levy process that you get in the limit. Okay, so this was uh, particularly uh, well studied by um, Marta Tarin Kaminska, where she proved that there exists the, the convergence to alpha stable Levy process. And um, but the point uh, here that is different of uh, Marta's work is the fact that we are going to allow the existence of clustering of uh, rare events or clustering of these uh, high observations. So in the sense that 
uh, well, this is the usual alpha lab uh, process. And as you can see, this j jumps appear kind of isolated, OK? But one can easily create clustering simply, for example, by choosing an observable function, which uh, uh, is like this, is a power law like that. OK, so here I'm going to take, so the dynamics is simple dynamics. It's just 3x mod 1. And now I take an observable function that looks like this. So it's the distance to 1 half, which is a fixed point, OK, raised to the power minus 2. And the fact that 1 half is a fixed point, this means that uh, when you see a big jump, you're, uh, you should see another one very close to it, and possibly another one. And so, in fact, there is a, a sequence of jumps getting, a fading sequence of jumps getting smaller and smaller. And here, what I have here is this is a finite sample simulation of this process here. And as you can see, the jumps have got some something here and some accumulation there. And that's precisely what we are trying to understand. How do we model these things here? which cause a problem for the convergence in the usual, usual J1 uh, topology, OK? So uh, I should say that, well, I shows this uh, talk here, but uh, well, Mike also shows the same <laughs> topic. And then we decided, so fortunately, the paper is very long. So this is just uh, uh, the motivation for his talk. And I'm going to get into the more um, extreme value stuff. OK, so the, 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 the point now is that studying these sums, so this is the motivation, studying these sums and trying to understand what happens when we have clustering here, um, turns out to be a, a, um, a linked uh, problem to the study of extreme values. OK, and the reason is because uh, in the heavy tailed case, the sums are more or less of the order of the highest observations. And so that's why tools of ex extreme value theory are so useful in these type of situations, OK? So now, uh, for the rest of this uh, part, see Mike's talk. And I'm going to work on the objects we used uh, in order to study these functional uh, limit theorems, OK? So our approach now is basically has to do with the extreme value theory where one is majorly interested, so this is the classical, uh, in the classical setting, one is essentially interested with the uh, distributional behavior of the maximum of um, uh, a finite dimensional sum, okay? So I just take here the norms of the first observations and take its maximum, okay? And the point is, we say that we have an extreme value law, if we can find normalizing sequences such that there will be a distributional limit here for this maximum, OK? So this is a well-studied problem. Mark, uh, Matt have lots of contributions about this. And um, OK, and so this is also related to another topic, which is the study of records, which is another of the applications we made in this paper. So basically, um, so, uh, humankind is obsessed with records, so created the Guinness Book of Records and, and so on. And um, basically, uh, it comes out as a byproduct of the convergence of these uh, um, point processes that I'll present you next. Okay, so let me define you what I mean by record times. So basically, I define here the kth record time, which is the the smallest time after the kth minus one record time where uh, our observation uh, supersedes the running maximum, okay? So you observe uh, a record and then you wait until you, for the first time, go above that value and that is the running uh, maximum. And then you wait until you get again above that and that gives you the record times, OK? And uh, for that, then I'll use this uh, process that I define here 
this is a, a, a point process defined on, on the positive line, which charges the points i over n. So i over n is just the usual normalization one does for time. And then the points get charged if the uh, if observation is actually a record. OK? Right. And, and uh, one of the applications is uh, regarding the convergence of this uh, point process. OK, and, and of course, the, 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 the problem with clustering and when one studies records is that you, uh, um, when you have a, a cluster of high observations and you do the time normalization, this cluster gets collapsed. And then if you're trying to study records, you may run into the problem that during the cluster, you observe new records. And this information is lost if you don't make an effort to try to keep it, okay? Right, okay, so this is about the setting. So this is a very long slide, but it's actually, uh, so it's, uh, maybe I, I draw a picture about what I, what I want here. I think I have to move this here. So basically, I want to define um, uh, and, uh, that, uh, some behavior for the observable function. And I want the observable function to be high whenever we enter in the vicinity of some set with uh, zero measure. So basically, well, take uh, one point, for example, like I was taking there. OK, so let's say you want the, um, uh, this will be your Ma uh, maximal point, and then I get an observable function psi, which basically uh, behaves like the distance, uh, some g of the distance to this uh, z point, where g is as a global maximum at zero. So if I draw a picture, let's say this is zeta, I want some observable that so does something like this, right? Here at zeta, it's as the top or the highest observation. This can be something going to infinity. And basically, when one um, observes an i value, so this means you go inside some region, some neighborhood of zeta. Okay, so that's the picture I want to have in mind with these conditions. Of course, there are some technicalities there, and we try to capture all possible types of behavior. And so that's why we consider that she can take one of these three possible uh, types. And for people who know Schoen value theory, then in, one easily recognizes here the case of um, light tails, where typically appears a gamble uh, kind of um, limit law. Here is the Frechet case. So here is the case. For example, I was talking about in our motivation corresponding to heavy tails. And this one is, well, the extremely light tails where uh, <coughs> you're, uh, you have a, a actually a, a finite uh, support. OK? Right. So th this is the setting. And uh, of course, we want uh, some normalizing sequences now. And typically, these normalizing sequences are chosen to satisfy this equation here. OK? So if you remember the um, uh, Poisson approximation to the binomial distribution, one asks that n times pn goes to something, to some positive frequency. That's precisely what we are doing here. So we are saying that among n observations, uh, we estimate to um, supersede this threshold un of tau, uh, tau times. OK? That's basically what this normalization says. And then, of course, I'm, I'm assuming the existence of these threshold functions. And this is the generalized inverse of these un functions. And this one tries to capture um, the symptotic frequency associated to a certain value. So basically, if you take z uh, on the range of the uh, random variable, the norm of x0, then what u n of minus 1 of z gives you is um, the asymptotic frequency associated 
to the number of exceedances of a level that is put at this level z. Okay, so that's the meaning of un minus one of z. So in some sense, un minus one of z gives you some sort of, um, let's say, uh, severity of your exceedance. If uh, your frequency is very, very low, is close to zero, it means that you expect very few exceedances, which means that you should be very close to the point Z in that case. So if uh, UN minus one of Z is high, then, well, you expect many um, uh, exceedances, okay? Okay, just by the way, so uh, uh, in terms of the records, so if XJ is a record value, then its associated uh, frequency is, of course, less than the associated frequency of the running maximum. Okay. Right. Okay. So here is the first approach to the point processes we'll be using. Okay. So, so, uh, but uh, in fact, we'll be working with something more sophisticated with the, uh, than this. But this is just to, to give an idea. So what we do now, we create a point process where we keep on the first coordinate, in some sense, how close we got to the point Z. OK? Right. And then one has to study the convergence of this uh, point process. And eventually, in the end, the convergence of this point process, by using uh, good projections, is, uh, allows you to get these functional limit theorems. Okay. Okay, something more sophisticated than that, but I'll get to that. Okay, by the way, um, how does one prove the convergence of these type of point processes? Well, the basic idea is something that Ledbetter already used, and I guess he borrowed from uh, Markov's uh, idea of splitting uh, data into blocks. Okay, so it's basic, the, the proof for, uh, for the convergence of this is based on this idea of splitting the old data into KN blocks. Okay, well, two KN blocks, in fact, where there are some big blocks and some small blocks, right? So the small blocks are just to, we're just going to neglect whatever is happening in these small blocks. And they are being used to create a time gap between the big blocks, okay? And of course, the, so the TNs must be uh, much smaller than the RNs. And then hopefully the RNs capture all the information and since they have now a time gap between them, they should be more or less independent. And that's basically the idea one uses to prove this uh, sort of theorem. Okay, so these are the conditions actually one imposes in order to obtain the convergence. So here is a restriction. So this is telling you that in fact, Tn must be asymptotically much smaller than Rn, okay? And then the first condition is requiring, so this is something uh, typical, one requires mixing so i want that two events separated by a time gap of size t get uh, more and more independent as this t increases and in fact i assume the existence of a, a, a sequence tn like that so that this rate here when multiplied by n goes to zero okay so this imposes some sort of mixing and then there is a second condition which is very typical in, in the extreme value theory. And it's basically forbidding the existence of more than one cluster inside each one of these big blocks, okay? So I'm forbidding the existence of more than one clustering inside of these blocks. Okay, so if these two conditions are satisfied, then one gets convergence of this point process. So, so this is, so I took this from uh, this paper with Anne Christina and Mari Magalhães. And so basically, so we assume that we have a, a nice system, think about something uniformly expanding and uh, with a well-behaved uh, invariant measure with respect to Lebesgue. Here, hem is simple, it's just a point. And then um, there exists um, a Poisson process with intensity given by Lebesgue times a number there called theta, the extremal index, such that these point processes that I introduced early converge 
to, in this case, well, a simple Poisson process with this intensity measure, okay? And in the case of having a repelling periodic point, then you see something a little bit different, okay? So here now, this Q has got to do with the condition I had before. This theta is the extremal index, is measuring the intensity of clustering, and it's actually given by one minus the determinant of the derivative, raised to the power minus one, so I'm missing here minus one. Yes. And then the process can be written as, so basically, there exists, you see this, uh, uh, so the time component is the same, but here, instead of, uh, so in the case L equals to zero, you just put a dot in UI as well, as well. but then you also have, have to plot all this uh, sequence, all these points, okay? And so here's a picture, again, in dimension one. So this is the case of non-periodic points. This is the case of periodic points. Okay, so basically you get here a Poisson uh, process, a usual Poisson process, okay? And the exceedances, so here I draw, this is tau, tau equal to one, okay? So this means uh, when we expect one uh, exceedance among n observations, okay? And then you see that there are some, um, how do you say, evenly distributed, uh, uh, exceedances along the timeline. That's what one expects. And then one has this type of behavior, which is quite different. And as you can see, there is some sort of vertical piles here, okay? So basically the bottom points here are the points that come from a Poisson process like that with a slower intensity given by this theta. And then on the top of it, one has this pile of points corresponding to the these values of the derivative um, that one see, the derivative at zeta, because that's exactly what one sees there, is the, the expanding behavior of the repelling periodic point. Okay? And so basically you have some geometric law here, which in if you're studying one dimensional uh, point process, this means that you'll get a convergence to a compound Poisson process with the polya apply kind of distribution, okay? So in the picture here in the observations corresponding to this means that instead of having isolated uh, exceedances, one has cluster of observations. And since the, uh, the, the, we have a repelling periodic point, it means that once you observe uh, an eye observation, you're supposed to go down. Of course, the picture is not correctly drawn because you should go down geometrically. So, but here is just to, to uh, no, no. Uh, well, here yes, but uh, it's just uh, I, I drew I draw this uh, drew this with Mathematica, and uh, I tried to have some control about it, but then I gave up. I just uh, decided to do this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's Mathematica shows them. <laughs> okay, but uh, but in fact there are uh, as you can see because of the way I I, I tell him to draw the the picture. Uh, it shows colors according to the piles you see here. Yeah. But in there, I don't understand the colors. <laughs> here I do, in that picture, no. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it has to do with, uh, it's, it's like in strips, right? It says here, different strips. Uh, uh, no. Sorry, <laughs> don't have a, a better explanation. Okay, by the way, so this is what happens in that, kind of situation, but let me tell you that, okay. But you can easily create different type of clustering profiles. So for example, let's say I go there and I mess around with the way in which the, um, the observations appear. And you see here that there is a different profile and still in the limit, you see exactly the same picture because the stacking collapses the information and puts everything in the vertical direction and you don't uh, realize the ordering anymore, okay? And so if you're studying records, for example, this is a completely different situation of that one because here the records will be here, here, there, and there, right? 
Here, the records are completely different because you have one record here, another record during this cluster, then another record there, and then you're going to see that this one, there will be another record there. And this information is completely lost in the limit process. So that's what we are trying now here to recapture. OK, by the way, I just remember that I, I forgot to mention that there are some um, related results with this one. So let me mention the work of this is um, Mike Todd and Mark Holland. So they consider the convergence of bidimensional point processes with thinning to study records as well. And then there is uh, these uh, beautiful papers by um, Francoise and uh, Penn and Benoit Sosol about the convergence of spatial temporal point processes, where they also study records as well. And there is a very recent paper uh, in the line of these two uh, by Roland Weilmuller here in 2022. OK. And so for the purpose of this talk, what we did with Mike was try to get some how the ordering of this clustering of observations into the point process, OK? And so to do that, we uh, were motivated by this, uh, well, I like a lot this paper by Basrak, and now I can't for, uh, remember the name of the two other authors, but it's a beautiful paper. And uh, they used what uh, um, Basrak and Segers introduced in 2009, which, which is called the tail process, okay? So you adapted the tail process to what we want here because the tail process was only meant for, um, for heavy tailed kind of phenomena. And here we allow any type of behavior in the tail, okay? And basically what one does is we go into this, um, we go into this, um, uh, how to say, uh, blocks, okay? And uh, we don't split information. We consider the whole block at once. And so uh, let me go uh, to the future a little bit. So we are, we are going to put now in the first coordinate, Instead of putting observations, we are going to put blocks. So what you see here is the if block, not observation anymore. And in the second coordinate, we've got the, all the block information regarding the, um, uh, uh, regarding the, the exceedances. Okay? So how does that work? So basically, I consider here a vector. Okay? And you have to see that as n grows, the blocks are growing. OK, so this vector is getting larger and larger as n uh, grows. And so in the end, this will eventually converge to, in fact, to an infinite sequence. OK? But we want to capture the, um, the clustering observations. So the clustering profile, that's what we want to capture. So the key idea is to take the distributional limit of these blocks, given that at the beginning of the block, one observes an exceedance, because that's the key point of, of uh, getting clustering. So we only have clustering of rare events if you have a rare event in the first place, right? So this is uh, asking for the existence of a, a conditional distributional limit for these blocks that are somehow capturing the, the frequency of the, the exceedances. And we are particularly interested in their, uh, in their ordering, OK? And so in the end, well, there are a bunch of conditions here. Uh, but the main one is this. And the second one that goes after that, which is basically saying that, well, this first observation here is, in fact, the beginning of a new cluster, OK? Because I am saying, OK, what's happening to the block, given that the first one, the first observation is an exceedance? Well, but the cluster could have begun earlier, OK? So by imposing that uh, conditioning there, I'm saying that, in fact, that exceedance that one observes at the beginning of the block was in fact the beginning of a new cluster, okay? And so this finally defines what we mean by the piling process, 
okay, which is supposed to keep the record about these things, about the, the clustering profile. And then we do a spectral, spectral decomposition of this uh, filing process by putting here. So here we capture amount you have to multiply to build that pile you saw there, okay? Right, so here's the theorem from um, this paper with Mike and, uh, and Christina. So basically we consider then this uh, new uh, point process uh, with count, uh, counting the, the time positions of the, the, of the cloud of blocks which give you clusters, okay? And here, the clustering profile. And then the limit says that, well, in the limit, we have again a Poisson uh, point process ruling everything. Okay. So there are these TIs and these PIs, they actually follow uh, a Lebesgue times theta Lebesgue um, intensity measure. Uh, um, so that they have a, a Poisson process with this intensity measure. And then these PIs get it multiplied by this B infinite sequence, which is supposed to capture the clustering profile, okay? So here is how severe is the cluster, and here is what if it goes off first, if it goes down later, and so on, okay? Right, so from this conversions here, now we immediately obtain almost by using the continuous mapping theorem, uh, a result regarding the convergence of the record point process. So first we start by defining this function there. So what this function does is it goes to an infinite sequence, okay? And what it does, it's gonna count. Uh, so it, it gives you, so you, we must give it first a frequency. So this Y is a certain frequency. So this is like the running uh, maximum. So it's the running record, okay? So you put the running record then, and then you're, ha let's say you have an, uh, a new uh, cluster and we are gonna count now the number of records above that value that you'll see by the values of this uh, B-infinite sequence. That's what the, this RXY function does, okay? <coughs> and with this defined, then I can now state the theorem for um, the record point process. So the record point process will converge to something that looks like this. So if there was no clustering, one would see this. And this is uh, a Poisson point process on the real line with intensity measure given by x minus one dx. Okay, so this is the classical thing. It's basically saying that is becoming more and more difficult to see records because, uh, well, uh, that's the story of the beauty about records, right? It's getting more and more difficult of exceeding one. And then it gets another contribution by this ki function. And this ki function is, oh, this ki random variable are iid independent random variables that are distributed as, and this is r, of the key kj, this is the piling pro the, sp the spectral part of the um, of the piling process observed at uh, a u minus one. So u is uniformly distributed random variable in zero one raised to the power minus one. So you get any positive frequency, and then you're counting the number of times that uh, the the piling process is creating records above this uh, frequency. Okay. Right, so I'm almost in the end. So uh, to which systems we can apply uh, this theory? Okay, firstly to uniformly expanding systems, because for these systems, uh, including usual uniformly expanding maps on the interval, Markov maps, like so Sol's higher dimensional expanding maps, one has uh, uh, great information about decay relations, in particular decay relations against L1 observables, and that is very nice to prove that those D and D prime conditions hold, and then everything will work out. So here are some uh, examples of those maps. 
Well, we can actually apply them to Benedict's castle quadratic maps. This is something we did in, back in 2013 to show basically that those conditions uh, kind of work. And by using uh, um, some inducing arguments, we can actually prove it also for uh, the manville pomos or the Liveranius or Solvayenti maps, like you see here. Okay, so, but this is it. This is the references. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about random dynamical systems and happy birthday to our two birthday kids here. In fact, I originally wanted to talk about the different subject when to talk about concentration and qualities, but then I didn't quite make it to the end of the example I wanted to tell. So I will talk about something maybe somebody, some people here have heard before. So we'll talk about return times instead, also for random dynamical systems. So M is some set, some manifold. But I will give conditions later. And we have a bunch of maps. They are on M. And they are chosen by so driving space. So omega will be some shift space, say A to some Z. This A could be a finite state space or could be an interval or something like this. Good is the driving space. So typically we take a point omega in an omega. So this omega will be a double infinite vector. And traditionally, oftentimes it's W naught will determine what your map is. That's quite traditional. One way to describe the action is using the a, a skew, a skew map. That's a map to acts on the product space. So this would be S, which maps omega to M to itself. And the way that acts is you have on the shift space, similar to shift transformation. So theta maps this, so this is the left shift. And this map here, S for omega, so this is the point here that picks your map, would be theta omega, and then you apply T omega to that point. That's how it acts. If we take an iterate of that, then it would come out as, well, the first variable is the theta to the N, so it shifts N times, and the second one is a composition of maps t to the n, t to the omega to the n. So this t omega to the n, what is it? It is, or you begin with t omega. t omega maps, I would say omega to m theta omega. m omega is shorthand for simply the fiber of m over omega. So here, the space. So here we say, this would be say omega, or this one is omega, say, and this here would be M. So it would be this one here. That's a copy of, a copy of M. This composes theta omega, so it snaps this one to theta squared omega, until you come to the last one, theta N minus one. Omega, that's the last one. So this is what what this is what you understand with a with a perturbed system, which is driven by this space here. Now we have to do some measures. So this is going to be given some probabilities, say some IID measure here. So nu is a probability measure on omega invariant under thick under invariant under the shift map, the theta invariant. See mm -hmm. IID, for instance, if this is say two symbols, two symbols, zero, one, it could be some 50, 50% or something like this. Bernoulli could be a Bernoulli measure. So what we want to look at is, we want to assume that there's also a measure on 
we have fiber measures. Fiber measures on M, where it should be actually an omega here. And they shall be uh, quasi invariant. So we don't have invariance anymore because this space is not the same one as this one anymore. Because if you apply the map T omega to mu omega, this is going to live in a different space. So if we pick, put in the test function there, that would be mu omega of chi composed T omega. And so this one here would be living on theta omega of chi. So the so T omega, mu omega will be you will be moving along because the point move because the point moves along. Well, one measure we need is called the annealed or the marginal measure. which is mu, which is simply the integral of all these with respect to, to this measure nu here. Nu of omega. So this is the marginal measure. That's the average. That's the average measure. So what do I want to look at? We want to look at return times two balls. So we take a point X in M and we look at the wall of some radius B row of X. So we cut a kind of like a hole and we're gonna watch now how often, you, how often you're going to come back. Then we look, we observe our points for a period of time and the time is going to be say some parameter we stick in there and we normalize, we normalize by the, by the average measure. So T is simply some parameter. <coughs> then we count the hit, hitting time counter, hitting counter, I should say, counter. W depends on, depends on X, depends on row. What is it? Well, J goes from zero to say N minus one. And then we get characteristic function here, B row of X and compose this with T omega. So we should stick an omega here to the, to the J. So in the deterministic setting, of course, this is always the same map and you really count how often you're going to come back to this, to this neighborhood you're cutting out from, uh, cutting out from your M. So this is the counting function. So what we're interested in is the statistics of, of coming back. So here we're going to watch up to time t, which is reciprocal there. So in deterministic case, of course, there's Katz's, Katz's formula, which tells you, well, that this is just the right, right, the right scaling you should be looking at in the generic case, at least. So, we want to show the following theorem, and this is this is done jointly with jointly with Jiakang Wang. The, the probability, the probability of with respect to so this is this is on the fiber of W omega x and rho being equal to k, this is going to converge to Poissonian, which means e to the minus t, uh, t to the k over k factorial as rho goes to, it goes to zero for almost every x, for mu almost every x, And for almost new, almost every omega in omega. 
So this is called, this is an, what's called a uh, quenched limit. A quenched limit because it's done on the fiber given by omega. And what you get is you get the statistics here, which is an annealed statistics. So everybody behaves more or less the same thing. So it's like the law of large, the law of large numbers where nearly every point, every sequence is going to give you the average, the, the average behavior. Bigger pardon? Product? Uh, not quite, not quite, no, no. Yes, of course, we can't say for every because there are, all, there are always possibly some problems. And Sandra will talk about this next week, I believe. We will talk exactly about this, what happens when you have well, clustering, as we heard just an hour ago. But this is the generic case. And what we get is we get a straight Poissonian. We don't get a compound Poissonian. And we have, don't have to compute the, uh, the factors for that. So what are the conditions? Well, we have to have some good conditions on, on the measure. Well, we can, of course, assume that the measure has some foliation on, depending on, on gamma, on omega. So we could do this, or we, I can just assume everything is expanding to make it a little bit simpler. Let's assume, let's assume we have an expanding case. It makes it a little bit simpler. So what we want to assume is that we have some balls, some radius. We can cover the space M with some uniform size balls. It's a cover, cover of, of M. The purpose here is that the measure of that, the new omega measures of these balls shall be, say, big O of one, in particular, shall be bounded from below in a uniform way, because this has to do with the way the approximations are done. So this turns out to be very important. Deterministic case, for instance, when you have a young tower, normally you would look at the, say, on the, would look at the base the base, once you expand with the base, then you have something which is in the measure bounded from below and you, you, and you can do estimates for the error terms. Then what we do is, if phi, if, you, if phi is an I sub omega n, these are the inverse branches, inverse branches of T omega to the n. Then we call zeta, which is phi of phi of br of these guys here, we call this n cylinders. Well, this is just our idiosyncratic terminology because they play kind of the role of cylinders because the map is, well, one to one of these cylinders. Then what we need is we need the kill of collisions. So you take the test functions, you map one forward, you integrate fiber wise. You want to have this go towards its average. So you need this one here. This shall be less or equal something that goes to zero, say, and then here you get you get the right norms. Infinity norm. We assume if infinity norm in that case. If it's not expanding, then this is enough to have it on functions which are constant, locally constant on local stable leaves. And it's enough to have it for this. But if I assume it's expanding well, then this will do. And also, this is so this is the quenched, this is the quenched case. 
Well, sometimes there's a constant which depends on omega, and then one has to ask also for the annealed one to, to, to decay at some rate. D mu, so this would be annealed. Same thing. Lipschitz and H infinity. But if this doesn't depend on omega, then it follows simply by integration. Well, I don't know what's the omega here because this is a product, a skewbrack. So you have to first do an omega integral and then you have to do an, a first. Make one. Yes. They shall, yes, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say at what rate. So lambda of n, we assume should be of something like n to the minus p, but there are a whole lot of parameters floating around and you have to choose them so it just doesn't make it, everything work. But there's gonna be some right and assume some other parameters as well. Then you can play one parameter against another one. So these are the, the curve correlation. Let me have a couple other conditions. For instance, we have a condition on, well, distortion. Well, usually this one assumes that the Jacobian would be, so that's a Jacobian, if this is the fiberwise Jacobian for, for N applications, and you choose two points, say, in an N cylinder, and you want to be able to compare those, and we could allow for this to be, to grow at some right. If it grows at some right, well, you might need a little bit more of a P there, or some other things have to be better. So we can assume this is a figure of one, or we can assume this is big O of some, some number n to some power here, I don't know, D, some power distortion number, yeah, whatever distortion number here. D, D can be positive. But we, we can assume simply this one here. In fact, <clears throat> it's sufficient that this is true most of the time. So you, you can allow for an exceptional set. Again, smallness is what matters. You can have an exceptional set where this fails. For instance, if you want to take, say, an intermittent map, uh, manual per more, then you want to take out the parabolic point and make this small, and then apply to all the rest. Maybe put something like this in here, and then make sure that your alpha is close enough to zero to get enough of get enough of a p here. Then. We have contraction. We want to have, we want to, we want to make sure that these guys decay at some rate, polynomial rate. So the diameter, so there should be a delta of n, which should be like n to some, some minus kappa for kappa, some kappa bigger, the bigger the kappa, the better, of course. So that the diameter of zeta is bounded by delta of n for zeta n cylinders. And then final, well, two more, two more things actually. We don't want to have the measures mu omega be pathological. So the dimension of the measure should be so mu omega of say balls p rho of x shall be uh, bounded below by some rho to the d1. This d1 should be, well, should be finite. So you wanna have something here. And again, this is a parameter depending what this number is, you might need more of this, or you might have 
be you might need more of this. We can you can play this against one of them. For instance, if in the one-dimensional case, if some measure, absolute continuous measure you know, equal to one. And then this one here, the analyst, the eternal analyst condition. Because when you look at the main terms, you have to approximate. And when we approximate, we need a Lipschitz continuous function. So the balls have to approximate Lipschitz continuous functions, and that's where the analyst condition comes in. So you want to have, you have a ball here, you fatten it a little bit, you put something here, say R, you want to make sure that the percentage of what you add compared to what you have before shall be very small, or not at least not too big. So, which is, there are various ways you can also with mu done, be done with mu. So you add a little bit, take away. So this is the analyst compared in percentage. This should be something like something like r to the cross i divided by rho to the beta. And what we need, cross i shall be at least as big as beta, I believe. So, so these are the requirements we have. And you might notice typically, of course, that's what you get. So this, this one here simply tells you that the pieces shall be big enough. Take care of collations, of course, because when have things be mixing, you get independence. And then this is not too surprising because you're going to be able to compare within sets what happens when you expand and things have to become small, of course. Under these conditions, you get, you get, a, you get the validity of this main, main theorem there. So I might say something about how the proof proceeds. So, so sketch off the proof. The ingredients of the proof. So the first thing we do is we want to, we have an approximation theorem. So some of the recipe follows deterministic case and being adapted to the random case. And then there are some additional difficulties which come from the zero, one random variables, which of course are going to be the, in, what the in terms that show up in the W. So the XJ will be, you think of them as B row, Composed with T omega J. So this is what you're supposed to think. Then you put W C A B of X J, J goes from A to B. So one has to be more careful now keeping track of which the X J are because of the omega there. You can't assume independent, you can't use invariance anymore. You have to keep track of in which position you're going to do, because what you're going to do is you want to swap out these xj against independent ones. So the xj twiddle are independent. And in distribution, they are the same. And then you form, of course, similarly, the independent w. J goes from A to B. So what you want to do now is you want to compare, you want to compare this one here. This is of course the one we have originally, that's the one we're interested in. Assume this and compare this to the independent one, zero n. So in, in the, this one here in the, in the invariant case, deterministic 
invariant case would be like a Bernoulli. If you don't have independence, we have to live more careful computing that. So this is going to be less or equal R1 plus R2 plus R3. So what are these R1, R2, R3? R1 is, well, you're swapping out as we go along. You line them up from zero to N. The XJ, you line up the other ones the xj total, and then you begin swapping, swapping them out one at a time. That's what this R1 is. Well, we have to cut a hole, right? They, you have to cut a gap here to get independence, to get these to compare. Then you have to estimate these holes are not gonna to be too big. So R1 is the main principal part, which is the j goes from zero to n, and then you look at the difference of xj plus xj equal to one and the w j plus some delta to the end. Being say equal to some q. You compare this to, you split off one, now it's independent. I could have written an xj twiddle. And this one here, w j plus delta n equal to q. So this is the same as to say, this is equal to p of <coughs> xj, oh, maybe dot. Okay, it's okay. I could swap out this against the next twiddle. All right. and put a max here or a soup or whatever Q so you can add them up. So the delta is then for delta being positive, but much less than N you get. This is the principal part where you, where the delta here tells you how much independence you get. So here's the picture again. At J, you're gonna swap out, right? Here are the x total, here are the x's, at j you're going to swap out, but you only compare here at j plus delta. You ignore what happens until delta. And this is the other two are taking care of that. R2 is, j is the probability of, of course, up to n, of xj's equal to one and j plus one to j plus delta is, is it bigger than one. So you might have, you might pick up a hit too early. Normally we'd expect it takes a while to get a hit, but this is a very short time because if you think of the ter deterministic case, normally it takes off the order of capital N to pick up more hits because all the returns will be in cuts time. And capital N is a cuts time, N divided by the measure of measure of the ball. And this is way smaller here, this is way smaller. This is T over the measure, that, that's the scaling. And you're gonna take this, a power of this less than one, for instance. That's how I make it small. So it's practically 0% for this is huge. And this is practically, 0 0.1%, 0 0.0001%. So you don't really see it. Then this one is the easy one. Namely, you get this and pretend it's independent. And The proof then is to estimate all these terms. Well, this one is the easy, this is the easiest here. This is the most difficult one. This gives the most headache. And then from this one, you get the principal, from this you get the principal term. So I can show 
how to estimate estimate R1, for instance. Well, how do you do this? Well, this one here, when xj is equal to chi b rho of x composed t to the omega omega j. <clears throat> so you have this ball sitting there and you're looking at the fiber. So this is on which fiber is that? Well, it would be on the m theta j omega fiber. We have a ball on this fiber there. So you're going to approximate this now. Approximate by some Lipschitz functions, which is Lipschitz. You do this in the usual way. Like here's the ball, here's X. This is rho. This is what you have. That's this one here. And well, you give it some slope here. And you put this, this size here, make it small compared to the row. For instance, row to the W and W is a number bigger than one. Then phi Lipschitz is like row to the minus W. And then the R1 is two terms. Well, one of them comes from the, from the decay of collations where you pick a lambda of, of uh, delta. Then you get a phi Lipschitz and you pick up, well, this W J plus delta two n is equal to Q, but an infinity norm, well, that's one. So the, this one is one. So this H here, which is the characteristic function of Wj plus delta to n, this will be equal to Q or whatever in the infinity norm, but that's equal to one. It doesn't count. So then what do you get? Well, there's still another term to pick up and that's the analyst term. Plus the analyst term. How big is that? Well, this one, of course, has to be summed up over all the j, right, to n. The analyst term too has to be picked, has to be added over all those. So how big is it? Well, it's about n times, or yeah, n times, what do you get? Times the analyst, or how big is the analyst? Well, it's of the order of, what was it again? Row to the w to the, Psi divided by rho to the beta, right? That's what it is. This one here, well, this gives you about one over mu rho, which gives you one over rho to some dimension. And what you get here? Well, you get some, here's a here, get a one over t divided by mu of b rho. Then you get a delta to the minus p. Then you get a row to the minus w. What do you get here? Plus, well, you get a row to the minus d1. Then you get a plus a w to psi minus a beta. That tells you how the w is supposed to be. W is good for that and bad for that. And then you pick delta Delta is equal to the rho to the minus v for some for some v positive. So you pick up enough factors so we can trace them, right? What do we get? Something like rho to the minus d1 for this, rho to the what? Minus p, vp minus w plus rho to the minus d1 plus w zeta minus beta. And yeah, then you choose your parameters to make it small.
Hold on, so. So, the, all the rest relies on the result by, by some people who are here actually. This is Rousseau, so so, and Lorandas, one might remember. Namely, it's the following thing, that if you take this, if you integrate this ball, so you're integrating the xj, what are the xj? These are characteristic functions of b rho of x composed t omega j, right? And j goes from zero to, to n, which is, goes from zero to n of mu of theta j omega of the ball. That's the same thing by the quasi invariance. So normally if this were the deterministic case, these measures would be all the same and you would simply pick up a T. But here you two pick up a T, this goes towards T almost surely, almost surely omega for almost every omega, mu almost every omega. So we rely, rely upon that result here. So this is simply done by using Paul, Paul Cantelli and Chebyshev estimates, one to get estimates for the variance. So this is as rho goes to zero, but not quite so. As rho goes along a sequence to zero, which is summed with respect to some power. Rho goes to zero along a sequence. Rho i, so that rho i to some q is finite. That's Paul Cantelli. And there's a certain q which comes, which you compute from all these various various parameters. So you only know this is positive. So this is one of the problems we have, and we have to get around those. This is, we will choose rho i is e to the minus i to the alpha for some alpha less than one, but positive. So this surely satisfies this, but then you have to match up the parameters to make it, to make it work. Well, I'm not sure I will, how much I will see about these guys, but since now you kind of have seen how this guy's estimated, and this is the principal part here, this is just trash because you have control. This one is the easy one here because, well, you just get some controlled by delta here. This one is a difficult one. You have to open up another gap and you have to make more estimates about saying that very short returns simply don't really occur except on a very small set, which disappears at some rate as goes to zero. Then we can look, if you can see some of the principal part, maybe that's what I want to do. So the principal part is this one here. So you get the difference here, but that's the principal part. Is equal to K. So this is the probability of, well, you have this xj and j goes from zero to n shall be equal to k. So xk is our xj is as before this one here, t omega j. The measure of this u omega of xj is or the probability of xj equal to one. What is it? That the probability of x j equal to one, which is u of theta j omega of of this. So you can call this. We can call this say p j. We call this p j. Then you immediately see what happens, because what you get is what you get. You get most of them are going to be zero, right? 
because this is a huge number here. You just pick up a couple of them. So from zero to N, what do you pick up? You pick one minus PJ, you pick up these guys. And then you just pick up a couple of them, say I1, I2, couple of hits, IK, and then you get, what do you get? You get a product of these guys. I goes from one to K, J, L, okay, L. And then what do we get? We get a P, uh, what do we get? A P, I, L divided by one minus P, I, L. And this one doesn't count. That's an ordered sum. Make it unordered. Never mind a couple of diagonal terms. So then this becomes what? So this is well, one plus little over of one. This one is exponential, right? So this is e to the minus the sum of the pj. j goes from zero to n. What you get here? Well, you make it unordered. And now it's just all these combinations. It's just it's a product, right? It's a power. So you get an, a pj. This one, does, this one doesn't count. This guy doesn't count here. So just forget about this. P j, j goes from zero to n to the k. Okay, now you know, because we have the theorem by the gentleman here. According to that, so by these three guys here, we have the sum of p j, j from zero to n goes to what's t? as rho goes to zero along a sequence, as rho goes to zero along a sequence. So what happens? Well, this goes to what? This is e to the minus t. This is a one over k factorial. This is a t to the k. Okay, that's your principal part. Well, let's see, that's a couple of minutes left, I suppose. So, bigger one, 50, 15, okay. Okay, I can torture you some more. <laughs> that's the easy one here. I can tell you about that one. Estimate of R1, that one is easy. Well, because how does it work? R1, R1, what is R1? R3, R3, are this silly? Okay, R3. So what do you get here? What do you get? You get, of course, J goes from zero to N. Then what are these guys? These are the PJs, and we know what they are. They are exactly these measures there, okay? So we get a mu theta j omega of b rho. So that's this guy. What happens to this one? Well, we estimate from above. So this would be k goes from uh, one to delta. What do we get here? Well, you could have a hit at least on one of those, right? So you add them all up. So you could be theta j plus k of what? Of b rho. So the set of j plus one to delta, at least one, surely is contained in the union of these guys, namely all these x, j plus k equal to one and k k goes to from one to delta okay trivial what do you do with that you do estimate so what is this well this is not more than say some road power right some dimension say d naught 
So this whole thing is, and then you have this sum here. So this is lesser or equal what? Delta, rho to the d naught, and now we get this one here. Theta j omega of d rho x. And this one is t, almost surely. Again, along a subsequence. So you have to control this guy here. And did I see something wrong? No, I didn't, because you just make sure that this number is not too big. It's going to be beaten by this one here. So V shouldn't be too big. So in the decay of collisions, you want to have some big power. So you have bump up P. And how big P has to be? Well, it depends on this number here. All right, this one is easy. Now, this one is a tricky one. R2 is a difficult one. Maybe I shouldn't say too much about it. But one part of it has with very short returns. We have to make a distinction. Distinction between very short returns. And this is something Sandra won't have to bother with next week because when you look at clustering, the clustering takes care of that. Because the point here is to avoid exactly that you have, say, lepidic points, for instance, where you come back soon after again, or some periodic like behavior where it comes to soon ag back again. So this is something that's, that kind of only, only belongs to the generic case where you have to get rid of all these very short returns. So for instance, you put omega, you put this is all the set of all x's so that <coughs> you come back too soon omega b rho is not empty for some j between one and, and now how long are you going to watch? You're going to watch up to a size, some time, which is constant times just the log of the, of, the, of the radius. That's how long we are going to watch. So we are worried about this. And all this speed, we, the speeds of conversion we get in the end, they're all in terms of powers of log, logarithm of rho. And this still is enough to make it work. It's pretty slow though, but it still makes, it still works. Then one shows the following thing. Essentially, if you take, you take any other omega and you look at the size of this one here, then you can estimate that and it's going to be something like, like a delta of, del, let's call this number here J. Let's call this J short and J. That's the logarithmic, this obser observation time. Some delta of J to some power U1. There are some other terms there, but that's roughly what it looks like. So that's a contraction, that's a contraction time here. You get a logarithmic time here to some power. That's what you get. So this is how you want to control it. And then what you do is you split the R2 into a time between to zero. You avoid this. So you avoid this, you avoid this set here. So then you get another lemma. Namely, what you do is you put y is. Well, there's an omega here, there's an x. You have critical observation time. So you just put your characteristic function d rho of x intersected. And now the observation to the hitting time, theta j omega j from zero to n is less or equal say j. This is what you want to avoid. T omega j. Then what you get is, well, you get that, uh, what do you get? You get that this is equal to, 
what did I get? I keep for, I forget now. Okay, where is it? Yeah, the measure is small. The measure of y omega is less or equal one over log rho with some power gamma on a set outside a set. A set B rho, where mu omega B rho, actually it's mu, the annealed one is less or equal something like this again, some rho prime. So that's how you pass according to or so, so Sol and Varandas, we have rho y goes to zero. So you have to fill the gaps because you want to have rho go to zero in an arbitrary way. And for this, you have to walk a little bit. So you do the obvious thing. You approximate simply the W by rho, find the next rho i to fit it in, look at the contributions. There are two contributions being made. I don't want to write that down. One, simply because there's a slight difference in radius in annulus, or the annulus condition. And then there's the other one, which is a tricky one, which is made by the time difference. If you have a different row, the observation time is going to be longer. See, the row is a little bit smaller, then the observation time is going to be longer, and you have to account for this. And to kill that one, we need moments estimates. These are moment estimates. And for this, it turns out it's not enough to have variance estimates because the interesting cases like the one dimensions are not going to work, like parabolic, parabolic maps in one dimension are not going to be work because there's not enough space, not enough space to kill the last term. So we need higher powers to do this. So you can put ni is t divided by mu of b rho i of x. So then you have to estimate what happens between ni minus one and ni. So you form the function, which is you put say u is equal to so ui say. So what happens? J goes from ni minus one to ni and you take this. So you have to control this. And then what you get is if you integrate, so this is a function of omega, so there should be an omega here, right? I put an omega there, a uj omega. So we're going to integrate this now. And we raise it to a power n, or maybe, I don't know, power p. Uh, p is no good. I don't know, s. d nu of omega. Turns out this is less or equal to constant, no matter what j, no, no matter what. What did I say, J? Should be I. This is I. Because I tells you between the I minus first radius and the I radius. So this is for all, for all I. You get this. So you can drive up this power here and get better estimates. Anyhow, but I don't want to say anything else. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, thanks very much. <laughs>